Right, uh, good morning. Can I welcome everyone to this, the 22nd meeting of the Justice Committee in 2014. Can I ask everyone to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices, because even when they're at silent interfere with the microphones, no apologies have been received. Item 1. Invited to consider Item 4, review of evidence heard during our roundtable sessions this morning in private. Are you agreed? Agreed. Uh, next item of business, a one-off roundtable evidence session on brain injury and the criminal justice system. Now, welcome each participant to the session. And it may be, um, I don't know, but some may be a first time sitting, giving evidence to a committee. So what I, before I go any further, I just want to say that the method for this really is that you are the people speaking, and for once, and you'll love this, the politicians will be restrained, and so far as if they can be silent, uh, because I really want uh, the witnesses to interact with each other. Uh, but to indicate to me um, if you want to speak, and I'll call your names. I've got, I'll have a list here, so I'll let you know that I've got your name, and I'll also let you know if you're the next person to speak. Um, and your microphone, hopefully, because you'll be on your toes, will come on automatically, just as mine has done with a red light. You don't need to press anything, OK? Um, and uh, can I just say, um, you've got... Um, they, I'm so glad you've actually given up your time. So many professors are a bit inhibited and takes a bit to inhibit me. Copies of written submissions we've got, thank you very much, and they're circulated and complete with an amended uh, figure uh, in it from Professor Williams. Professor Williams. Thank you very much. And I think the best way to start, I know you've uh, introduced the people next to you, but is to start, invite each member and each participant to introduce themselves and it says here, starting with me. Well, I know who I am, so I'll just do that. Neil, you don't need to keep reminding me. I'm all right so far. <laughs> I'm Christine Graham, and I convene the committee. I'm uh, Elaine Murray. I'm the vice convener of the committee. I'm Brian O'Neill from the Brain Injury Rehabilitation Trust. Margaret Mitchell, member of the Justice Committee. Uh, Oliver Aldridge uh, from the Howard League Society for Penal Reform in Scotland. I'm Roderick Campbell. I'm MSP for North East Fife and a member of the Justice Committee. I'm Jean McFarlane. I'm a clinical neuropsychologist working in the NHS and part of the Division of Neuropsychology. Good morning, Christian Alad, member of the committee. Good uh, morning, John for the MSP Highlands and Islands. Uh, Highlands and Islands. Great, John. Never let me down. Yes. Next, please. Andrew Allen, Police Scotland, Criminal Justice Division. Douglas Gentleman, a consultant in neuro rehabilitation in NHS Tayside. It's Sandra White, MSP Glasgow Kelvin, and a member of the committee. Alan Carson, I'm a consultant in neuropsychiatry in Edinburgh at the National uh, Brain Injury Unit, but I'm here as the lead clinician of the Scottish Acquired Brain Injury Network. With Parker, Assistant Director for Health and Care for the Scottish Prison Service. Alison McInnes, MSP for North East Scotland, member of the Justice Committee. Hugh Williams, uh, Clinical Neuropsychologist and Deputy Chair of the uh, Policy Unit of a Division of Neuropsychology. John Pentland, MSP for Mother and Wishaw and a member of the Justice Committee. Tom McMillan, Professor of Clinical Neuropsychology at the University of Glasgow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, as I say, um, what we do is we ask you to bring it to our attention. We've got about an hour and a bit for, in a sense, for the case to be made to the committee uh, about the importance um, of the connections between brain injury, the criminal justice system, and perhaps how it's letting people down from, from what we have seen, if I just put it in this uh, short terms. So first of all, you know, why, why are you here? Mm -hmm. And why should we listen to you? Who wants to start? Thank you, Professor Williams. <laughs> you go for it. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I, th I think uh, the main point to, do, to be made is that um, there's a lot of neuro disabilities. That's general brain injuries of various kinds in people who end up in the prison system. Uh, traumatic brain injury, uh, where it's caused by, say, falls or assault or accidents, um, tend to be a big factor. And the, the rate of brain injury is very high in terms of its prevalence, the numbers of, of people in the prison systems who seem to have brain injury. And the trends in studies that we've conducted and internationally would indicate that the presence of brain injury is associated with problems in rehabilitation. So it tends to be associated with greater degrees of reoffending greater problems in mental health issues and greater difficulties in engaging with treatments around mental health and, and uh, resettlement. Uh, so it's probably likely that uh, trying to address the issues of brain injury, not only because it's a chronic uh, health condition in this population, might be beneficial in reducing long-term costs by reducing uh, crime, but also reducing the number of victims of crime as well. 
Does anybody else want to come in? Um, I don't see anybody indicating. I mean, are we letting people down in the system? Could I ask, um, just to stimulate it? Yes, Dr Aldridge. Um, my main sort of clinical experience is in addictions medicine. Uh, and I work in a court-mandated community-based drug treatment program. Uh, and in that context, I see a number... A number of people. I mean, we, we have a, a population who, where the statistics, if you ask people, have you ever been hit hard enough on the head to be knocked out, or around 70 odd percent of our uh, clients will say, will give a positive response to that. But there's a subset of those people that, when you quiz them further about that, turn out to have had very, very significant levels of head injury. Some of them have been, have had neurosurgical treatment, some of them have started off in some level of follow-up and then dropped out and some of them have never had any follow-up at all and these folk don't seem to be identified um, in the criminal justice system and yet their injuries seem to impact on their ability to uh, engage with rehabilitation etc and it's very very difficult to get these people to a point where they can be treated um, for a start, one has to stabilise their drug use, and that usually one can do to a fairly significant extent. But it's, it's very, very difficult, even when you try to set up a, a referral pathway uh, into a rehabilitation service, to get people to that first appointment. And even if you get them to the first appointment, where they're assessed as needing further work done, uh, they tend not to go back. And we see this with bloodborne virus treatment. Uh, where people will uh, present to a service as soon as you're having to refer them outside of that service, the attendance rate plummets. And the way that we get people into bloodborne virus treatment is to bring the bloodborne virus treatment into the clinic. And I think that there is a, a pool of unmet need of people with very, very significant head injuries uh, that we could serve better if we could have an outreach kind of service going into criminal justice f facilities. Yes, Superintendent. I'd also like to highlight the, the link between brain injury, mental health and suicide rates. And although this is a discussion about criminal justice, very often it's the police who come into contact with individuals in suicidal uh, instances earlier than some of the other services. And the, the point that's been made about subsequent referral to services that can help the individuals and reduce the longer term cost to society uh, are considerable. Committee members, if I've got nobody else, please, if you want to ask something, because I, oh, we, yes, if you want to come back in, Professor Williams. I mean, you have priority as witnesses, but if there's a silence, the politicians will step in. You know that. <laughs> Professor Williams. Thank you. Can I just make a, a point um, to Dr. Aldrich and uh, uh, Superintendent Allen? Um, the, the big issue is that with these significant brain injuries that may be present in two or three in ten, say, um, uh, they will have cognitive problems, so they don't remember things. They're impulsive. Uh, they lack foresight and so on. So they don't plan ahead that well. Um, and they also they're, they lack insight into their problems. So, so they're, not, they're, they're not very aware of their problems, uh, which is why, um, uh, as uh, Superintendent Allen was pointing out, that the brain injury in a mix when it comes to suicidality is a big factor. We know that, uh, uh, that suicide, unfortunately, is a common occurrence after a brain injury. And a brain injury is a big risk factor for suicidality um, as well. Yes, Professor. Uh, we carried out um, a preliminary um, audit study in three prisons in um, the Glasgow area, uh, linking um, uh, medical records uh, to the current prison population, and found that 23% um, uh, of the prisoners uh, um, had been admitted to hospital um, at some point uh, in their lives uh, with a head injury. So we, had, we looked at records going back to the 1980s. And we carried out the, the, the study in, in just in April there. Uh, and what was uh, uh, interesting was that um, a very significant proportion had uh, intracranial injuries, suggesting they'd had a severe head injury. So about 50% of those with a head injury had had severe head injuries. Normally, the epidemiology of head injuries that 90% would have a mild head injury and 10% are severe. So it looked at first sight that there was um, uh, a significant number who'd had a severe head injury who were in prisons. And the other finding that was uh, of note is that um, 
if you look at the epidemiology of head injury, you, you tend to get them in, uh, in children. Um, there are peaks in children, um, in young adults, and then in older adults. In this group, um, of those with um, a severe head injury, a very high proportion um, had had their head injury before the age of 15. So they had the head injury at a time when their brain is continuing to form, their social brain will continue to develop until about the age of 25, uh, but had a, had a head injury relatively early in life. John. Thank you. It was to pick up on, on the point that Professor Muller made there, and, and in the, 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 the papers which were helpfully circulated in advance, there was a lot of reference to childhood injuries. And I wonder, with the philosophy of getting it right for every child, whether there is an issue about how that information is shared early on. Now, clearly, also, if you have a high percentage of people who um, have criminal behaviour, you also have a percentage who don't. So there is also the stigmatisation issue, just because someone sustains... I wonder if there's opportunities to head it off, first and foremost in childhood and before Superintendent Allen's colleagues come to be involved, which is in advance of any of this with the criminal justice system. If I can speak to that. Before you do that, can I just don't, don't fret. I've got, um, I've got um, Sandra, you're on my list after Elaine, but I've also got Mr Gentleman on. So I'll take Mr Gentleman next. OK, then I'll let the other members in that I have on your list. So you are on my, you're on my pink list. And you're on my yellow list, just so you know you're not being missed. Right. Okay. Sorry. Please, just go ahead. Um, I want to make two points, because they may not be necessarily obvious to everyone around the table. The first is that delivering services for brain-injured people, whether anything to do with the criminal justice system or not, requires quite a lot of individuals and agencies. Ideally, this should be done in a seamless way. The reality is, very often, it's not done in a seamless way, and this is a challenge. One of the challenges is when something happens, it might be another illness or it might be admission to the prison system, which cuts the thread of continuity, and then it's difficult very often for the individual to re-access services. The other thing that's not particularly obvious, or not necessarily obvious, is that nine-tenths of people who have had a significant brain injury, which, as Hugh Williams said, would affect their ability to think and reason and judge and so on, will look entirely normal from the outside. They don't have a, a, a plaster on, they're not using a wheelchair, they don't have a badge of disability, which at one level is a very good thing for them, but at another level it's not. And often the information which would allow professionals and others involved in their care to deal with them in a different and perhaps better way doesn't flow with them. Um, and, and that is a problem which I think is um, important to put on the table because it, it is an invisible uh, type of disabling condition. Does any other witness wish to come in on this continuity issue and how we might resolve it? Yes, Dr Aldridge. Yeah, I would definitely, uh, I would definitely second that. I think that um, where assessments have been done, there is a problem with flow of information. I mean, we don't get, uh, even within the criminal justice system, we don't get the information from, the prison, from any prison health assessments. And then the information that we gather, we pass on to people's general practitioners, but frequently they're moving around from one practice to another, and I think that continuity of care is definitely an issue, and it's not something that people tend to flag up unless you ask them specifically about their history. They don't tend to flag it up, and often don't see the significance of it themselves until you start to uh, question them. Eileen? Oh, sorry, I'll take Professor, then take Eileen. Um, I think one of the issues is that... Uh, um, young people who are admitted to hospital are often very keen to return to home. And even if services are offered, they don't always take them up. So it can be difficult sometimes to identify them and then, some, and then difficult for them to, um, to sometimes take up the services that even if they're available. And so I think there is an issue about um, prevention and prevention of people uh, uh, developing an, an offending profile. But I think the other issue is, of course, that in uh, uh, um, prisons there is a population there who have not had uh, uh, support or intervention, and one of the biggest risk factors for having a head injury is already having had a head injury. So you've got a population there um, at risk, potentially, of making their situation worse when they leave, including by having further head injury. Yeah, I, I, my interest was similar to, to that uh, expressed by John Finney, because at this 
the impression I got is that head injury and childhood are, well, for young people may result in problems further down the line. And I just wondered if more could be done just in terms of recording when, when, when a young person's maybe had a head, head injury and also an awareness raising amongst, whether it's teachers, others, that if behaviours start to show later on, that maybe that link could be made at a time before it gets as serious as uh, offending or a suicide or and the sort of more severe mental health issues come. This is a, a, an issue about general awareness that could possibly pick up problems for young people earlier on. Professor Williams, you want to come in? Yeah, thank you. I mean, I, I think th that's a, uh, an excellent point. Um, the, the, what tends to happen is some studies in New Zealand showing this, that uh, children may have a head injury around age five or six, even relatively mild injuries. Within two or three years, they start to have problems in school. Their attention is not as good. The concentration is not as good. Within four or five years, they start to get excluded from schools for, uh, for misbehaviour. They're twice as likely to end up sort of drifting out of schools and then drifting into crime. By the time they're 14 or 15, they start getting involved in rather impulsive kind of crimes. Um, so you can track there the kind of problem. The, the, the brain injuries in the young tends to lead to them falling out of school and into basically essentially bad company uh, and often being used by gangs and all the rest because they're suggestible. Um, so the, the critical um, uh, issue there is to make sure that there's links between A&E departments and GPs and schools and, um, and people who have an oversight for the management of kids going back into schools to ensure they get support to stay in schools and, uh, and enable them to, to learn in that environment rather than end up in a criminal justice system. Uh, our data in uh, one of our prison studies in adults showed that um, those with head injuries tended to be imprisoned from, on average, age 16 compared to age 21 in the non-head injured. So, a, so if you have a brain injury, you tend to be imprisoned from years younger and for longer and increasingly for more violent crimes. Yet I take on board exactly your point about we want to stay away from some, something that then stigmatises. The brain injury should not be something that stigmatises because the problem then is that if it is something that people will start to associate too much with necessarily ending up in crime, then people might not report that as an issue. What we want is for people to be able to report they've had a head injury and get help and support, which actually is uh, can lead to some very positive changes and they can reclaim their lives. Um, so we do need to steer very clear away from stigmatising but the problem is in society is that historically we've tended to see head injury or not seen it. Uh, we've seen it as something that uh, um, some, sometimes, as, as, as um, uh, Dr. Gentleman um, said, it's an invisible disability very often. So the problem is that in that darkness people have not really seen the true issue. I have on my members list, just to let you know, Sandra, Roderick, Margaret and Alison. So I'll take Sandra now. I have nobody on the witness list if you want to indicate. So you can come in. Thank you. Sandra next and then I'll take Thank you, uh, Ms. Parker. And, uh, welcome everyone. I wanted to touch on what John and uh, Elaine had also mentioned, but to go back to an earlier stage, I was interested in some of the submissions where it said pre-birth and birth trauma. And I wanted to raise the issue of uh, forcep birth and breech birth. Would that have consequent a brain injury? Has any studies been done into that? Actually, if, as a child has been born, would that have an effect, perhaps, on a brain injury and the actions of people as they go through? Yes, Professor Williams. Um, uh, there, there are some works uh, um, uh, that, that refers to the general idea of there being neuro disabilities um, and neuro disabilities from various sources, uh, so any form of uh, Im impairment to the brain. The, and, uh, and so there, there is a marked um, chance that in the offender population that there is uh, increased chances of being pretty much every form of neuro disability of those kinds, um, particularly brain injury. Um, uh, and uh, so you go fe things like fetal alcohol syndrome would be higher, um, uh, and, and ADHD and other conditions as well. So it's not necessarily just traumatic brain injury. Um, there's typically comorbidities with other issues, but brain injury seems to be the, the, um, the biggest issue in terms of prevalence. Professor McMillan wants to come in, oh, the yes. same thing, Sandra, and then you yep, can come back sure. in, yes. Um, I, I think if the injury was happening um, before around the time of birth, uh, there is, of course, monitoring uh, of milestones um, uh, uh, in newborn and uh, uh, in the early years of life. So there would normally be at least some safeguard that um, uh, a new developmental problem would be um, discovered um, I, I would expect the danger is more people who are children who are a bit older, um, where the follow-up is brief and, and um, uh, the difficulties are more likely to go undetected. 
Yes, uh, Mr. Uh, just on this point, um, the picture that's emerging about birth injury, as we've tended to call it down the years, is that a difficult labour, a difficult birth, is often a marker that there's been some form of developmental problem even before birth. And there's always been a tendency to identify the birth itself as perhaps the initiating event in why there's disability in the child subsequently, but the picture seems to be more complex than that. Yes, Dr Carson. And it's one of the issues I wanted to highlight in general about the discussion is from an epidemiological point of view this issue of what's called reverse causality. In other words, and the example was given of the New Zealand um, school study that brain injury doesn't happen randomly in the population. It often happens to people who have risk factors. So if you have behavioural problems as a child, you're more likely to have a brain injury. And it that New Zealand sort of cohorts that were worked up, the strong likelihood is that you were dealing, that the brain injuries were actually not necessarily relevant, but it was the other factors in the life that led to the brain injury also led to the other problems. Now that's, brain injury may well be a marker of a problem, but the vast majority of mild injuries, when people have looked at them, don't necessarily cause adverse consequences to the brain but they happen to people who have things going wrong with them, like substance misuse, alcohol misuse, behavioural problems, risk-taking behaviours, all of which strongly associate with criminality. And I think we have to be cautious in the mild injury cases, which are the vast majority, of not attributing everything to brain injury, but realising this is a much more complex social problem. Yes. Yes. Separately, in the much smaller number of severe injuries, I would fully agree with all that's, that's been said, but I think we need to separate these two aspects of the discussion out. Thinking of them all as the one group, I think, is actually highly misleading as to where the, the problems come from. No, that's, I understand that. That's, thank you for that distinction. Sandra? Uh, thank you very much. I'm coming to Ms. Parker, but I'm let Sandra finish her. Yes, thank, thanks very much. Same line, same line, though. Keep yes, on the same, yes, issue. The same yeah. line. Mr. Dr. Carson has actually touched on it. It's the severity or the level of injury. And I just wondered if you've got medical records and you're working in partnership with the NHS and the prisons, uh, would screening of you know, prisoners, would that come into force then about screening for Take head Ms. injuries? Parker, no. Take Ms. Parker in now, I think, on that one, I think, because that links into your Sorry, remits, yes. HMP Grampian is working in partnership with NHS Grampian staff to test a model of care to identify and diagnose traumatic brain injury on admission. A clinical neuropsychologist um, will provide in-reach support and transition into the community. And through the information that's gathered through the health assessment, that will further inform any offending behaviour programmes and um, healthcare records will be shared. Look at the, the feasibility of delivering either one-to-one -one support or group work support um, to address offending behaviour. The results of this pilot will be and will further inform this agenda. I understand there has been difficulty in recruiting However, it's looking like possibly September that this model of care could be tested in an environment where people are coming into prison and are being diagnosed or, or assessed, which responds to um, your, your query. Can I just add, where are the police in this? Because you know, people come out, maybe just get out and re-offend. Is there any connection made between the SPS and the Police Scotland? There is, but there's also a good connection between police and NHS the records in our custody environment. Uh, what you will see now is NHS nurses working in police custody facilities, and in many of them now, they have access to the NHS computer records within the police custody suite. So when uh, a person is asked a series of medical, physical and mental health questions on arrival, or presents in a way that we would have concerns, we can raise that with the nurses. They can then check what uh, information is on the health system and the care can be looked at. Uh, and then that information is introduced to the system 
either for assessment prior to release or for uh, use by the court systems. I'm just checking. Uh, Dr. Aldridge, you wanted to come in, but I wondered if it was on this, because otherwise I'll take Dr. Carson on this business of the continuity from prison to police. Is it on this line? It was more around the causation. I'll leave that just now then, because I think you're going, are you going to come in about... Uh, it was a specific comment on the records, actually. Yes, that's... I want we, to... We know from a lot of research, in particular stuff uh, from Professor Macmillan's group, but in NHS Scotland and indeed in the, the UK in general, that the medical records surrounding whether or whether or not somebody has had a brain injury are actually very poorly recorded. Um, and although that information is there, and it's certainly better than not having it, we know that a large proportion of people who've had very significant brain injuries is not well recorded in their medical record. And actually, we also know the reverse, that a group, a large group of people who haven't had any significant brain injury, what started out as a mild bump in the head over the years gets inflated in the medical records to be severe traumatic brain injury. The Scottish Acquired Brain Injury Network is currently putting a set of proposals together um, that are going to the National Services Division of the NHS to look at a dramatic change to how we record brain injury and starting to have a national program for proper recording of brain injury from the point of diagnosis in A&E &E onwards. Because actually when you're seeing somebody 10 years down the line, it's not a facile process trying to make this diagnosis. It's very, very complex um, trying to do it in retrospect. So. This is a programme Savin are quite excited about having um, promoted. And just to let you know, it's, it's in its infancy at this stage, that that might be of benefit. Can I keep to this recording and sharing? Is that what, we're, is that what you're going to ask about, speak about, Dr O'Neill and then Dr McFarlane? Is that the same kind of, on that? It was about the screening. Yes. Screening? That's fine. We'll keep to that just now. And you're on the same thing, okay. Professor. And we'll come back to you on records, right? And then I've got... And your, your causation. So, part, do you want you in, to keep to the records and so on? Uh, would causation be part of this as well? I, I don't think, want to park you if, you're, if it's on this theme. No, I mean, I think there's an element of, of that. I was going to say that I think that, that, that a useful concept is a kind of web of causation where you look at a large number of factors that in this group tend to be rooted in deprivation and trauma and uh, a lack of uh, social resilience. And for some people, the consequences of a head injury start to become a very predominant theme in, in their presentation. The difficulty is that when you look at it um, from a clinical perspective, so some people have had obvious very severe head injuries and have had treatment, and other people have been the victim, unfortunately, of physical abuse, where there have been active attempts at concealment at the time that they were children. And piecing together records is very, very difficult, actually. And uh, continuity of information definitely is an issue. I'm, I'm going to come in. I'm going to just, as I've got others, I've, I've got Dr. Neil, followed by Dr. McFarland, followed by yourself. OK, and then I'm going to take Roddy, who's been sitting for a while. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you very much. In line with this idea of a web of causation, um, the health services in prisons are increasingly good at identifying mental health problems and substance misuse and potentially if the person has a learning disability. What we're proposing is that screening of brain injury is added to that mix so we have a fuller understanding of the need of this population. Because screening is the first step and there are reliable measures such as the uh, comprehensive health assessment tool. Um, to identify the problem, that would then lead us to be able to look more closely at the kinds of difficulties this group have in terms of have they got behavior, behavioral discontrol problems, do they have emotional dysregulation problems that then would predispose them to further offence. Dr McFarland. I just wanted to add a, a little bit more about um, screening. That I know my uh, colleagues in Graham Payne are, are bringing in the same um, sort of programme um, pilot, but this will be for prisoners who have obviously got um, you know, a, a brain injury and there still will be a hidden population that prison is actually serving them quite well with the routine and, and structure within prison. But again, same as uh, what Dr Neil was saying about screening for all prisoners w w would be of use. Professor Williams. Yeah. And um, I'll take Ms Parker. Yeah. 
Thank you. In, in context of the screening, um, um, uh, Dr. O'Neill and uh, Dr. McFarlane mentioned uh, the chat, the, the comprehensive health assessment tool or screening measures. Um, that's now um, in use across the youth uh, secure estate in England, um, and it's just a few questions. So we don't want really to end up with too many screening tools and all the rest of it, but we do need to know what are the relevant factors um, in, in offending and, and brain injury and other neurodevelopmental problems that are now being screened for. Um, uh, and, and, uh, and it's really important to link records up. As, uh, as Dr. Carson mentioned, unfortunately, very often medical records are, are not full and they've been done in a hurry and all the rest of it. So very often um, medical records won't be um, a very uh, reliable resource, but it will at least be a resource, which is why uh, it's probably a very good opportunity to screen for these kinds of common neurodevelopmental disabilities, particularly brain injury, when people come into the um, criminal justice system um, and uh, at, uh, at that point, especially thinking about the young. Coming back to a point earlier about the developing brain, the critical issue that people need to understand now in terms of our understanding of developing brains is that um, because the plasticity in, in developing brains, an injury to a developing brain, we won't know what the consequence of that will be for years down the line, and very often the that brain will not develop in a normal way. So a bang on the head when young can have much more uh, devastating effects than when a brain is, is older. So we need to bear that in mind. Thank you. I'll take Ms Parker, then I will take you, Roddy, because that's around this whole uh, issue of the records and screening and so on. Yes. yes, the Justice Committee are aware that health boards are now responsible for the provision of health care services in Scottish prisons and a memorandum of understanding and information sharing agreement is in place. The new Director for Health and Justice um, at the Scottish Government, Andrina Adamson, in her capacity as Chair of the National Prison Health Network, is currently in discussion regarding setting up a work stream on brain injury in, in, for prisoners. <coughs> I know that she's interested and has invited some of the members that are here today given evidence to participate in that work stream and I think that would be an opportunity to look at some of these issues that have been raised today, for example information sharing, records, transfer of information um, and, and Gina unable to come today because she's on annual leave but it's is looking... Allowed. People are allowed it. It's allowed Sometimes it's said, people say, why? You know, we support her on annual leave. We'll just be that on the record. It's allowed. <laughs> she has proposed setting up this work stream um, in the autumn on her return. So that would be an opportunity to take forward some of these areas, particularly looking at Scottish prisons. And Andrina also chairs the custody suites, the transfer of health care into the police custody suites. So there's an opportunity to join some of that up. Can I say, I want to have the questions, I'll take, I'm happy if you don't want to do it this way, but I've got Roddy, Margaret and Alison who have been a while, if you want to put your questions out there and then I'll just let them be dealt with. And Roddy, what's, what do you want and to ask about? I, I was uh, initially going to be raising the issue of comprehensive health assessment tools in England, but you touched on that, Professor Williams, and said that didn't amount to more than a few questions. What I was really interested in from the justice point of view is what we could learn from other justice systems uh, in, in what way are other justice systems more advanced on this area than us? And bearing in mind what Ruth Parker is saying, obviously, well, we could take account of that moving forward. So I'm going to leave that question because I'm going to put that question out there. And then, Margaret, your question. Yes. Um, there's been a lot of concentration on uh, brain injuries of, of people in prison. But if an alternative to custody disposal is given, how do we then identify these people? There's some progress with them being on remand, but would this um, comprehensive health uh, assessment tool um, help for these people, or what else can be done? Um, Alison. Um, Intervention and Professor Williams talked about help and support and, and Ms Parker spoke about offender programmes and what I would find useful to understand is just how successful cognitive rehabilitation would be and, and where it is at at the moment you know if, if we do all this screening is it possible actually to make a significant difference oh, thank you thank you so I'm going to start first of all with what can we learn from our audience question Thank you, Professor Williams. Helpful to say that uh, the, the, the chat, the comprehensive health assessment tool, um, allows there to be. Uh, it, it's in different parts. So, from the risk assessment of suicidality and so on early on, through to neuro disabilities, is what's used in um, uh, in, in England in the youth offending institutions. Um, and that's uh, going to be moved into the community um, uh, side as well over the next year or so. 
uh, it's been quite helpful uh, so far because it's been shown to be very sensitive in terms of picking up on the issues. And then, incredibly importantly, uh, addressing whether something is a relatively mild issue that we don't really need to uh, have too much in the way of intensive intervention, just some education around, you know, can maybe your thinking has been affected to some extent or, um, or, um, or memory might be affected, but not to a severe degree but also like a triage system to, to identify the ones who really do need more intensive interventions. And in pilot projects that I'm um, involved with through the Disabilities Trust, where we've put link workers in, brain injury link workers, into two uh, major young offender institutions, in one in Leeds and one in, in Manchester, we are, we are finding that it's incredibly helpful to have these brain injury link workers to help um, the prison staff identify and then manage the, the young people with brain injury. Um, where the, there may have been an indication in the past that there was a, you know, a, a problem, but the, 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 the staff weren't aware of the true extent and the effect of those problems. And um, so, so it ha has become um, it's, uh, um, a useful system for identification. In terms of intervention, these kind of link worker projects seem to be... Yes, I want to sure. keep to the one topic. There's, sure. there's first of all other systems, then we'll come on to the other members' question. Dr Carson, you want to talk about what we can learn from other justice it, it, systems. No, it's really just to pick up on a small point about these screening tools like the chat and other measures, they do tend to be very sensitive. In other words, the chances are that they will pick up all people who have had a brain injury, but they tend not to be very specific. In other words, they also pick up a lot of other people who haven't had a brain injury. So, what about other justice well, systems? Uh, Can you perhaps I narrow it? I just really wanted to make that point with screening is that the uh -huh. problem is if you want actual proper diagnosis, it's quite labour intensive. Yes. And if you're thinking, as your colleague was mentioning, about custodial diversion as opposed to programmes within a custodial uh -huh. thing, that becomes quite a big issue. I think, I think we understand the complexity yeah. and it's not one, one size fits all or one reason for it. And there's the complex environmental family whatever has happened to you. Can I, can I go back to other justice systems? Because we've had examples from yourself. Professor. Has anybody else got examples for, I mean, is Scotland lagging behind? Sounds like it from what you're saying. Well, in, in, um, uh, I know that there's been submissions to the Welsh Assembly recently that we've been involved with along the same kind of lines. In, uh, in the United States, in New York, there's been uh, a recent initiative about screening all young people coming into the general um, uh, uh, justice system, uh, indicating that half of all the young people, male and female, um, have knockout histories. Um, so in other, er in other areas, in, in Canada, the similar uh, programs, Australia, New Zealand, there's, there's an interest in trying to screen more effectively. Um, so the screening side of things, that, that seems to be something people are picking up on as something that could be done. Dr O'Neill. Um, I think that other justice systems have... Uh, found ways of identifying particular problems that are associated with reoffending. Uh, so attentional dysfunction is something that uh, is likely after brain injury. And uh, one study found that if they identified who had attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, which is associated with impulsive behaviours, appropriately medicate this population, then their chances of offending is reduced by one third. So just by identifying a cognitive domain that is impaired, medicating to prevent the person engaging in impulsive behaviour, you're reducing by one third the uh, reoffending rate. Superintendent Allen. We also have to give the Scottish justice system some credit for how it deals with people with brain injuries as victims and witnesses. The police have the vulnerable database, vulnerable person database. We have the vulnerable witnesses and victims legislation. So there's a considerable amount of work being done across the justice system that I think puts us in a strong position compared to many countries. We know about that. We, we did the bill. But I think the issue might be is I think that people can seal or may not be aware that they have consequences from some injury at some point in their life. I, I think that's perhaps the issue that's coming up from as well, is you may not be aware that you've had some kind of brain injury and it's part of your problem. Um, and it might not be in your medical records. So, I think that relates to the, the range of causes that are described, yes. where the, the legislation and the database enables us to record vulnerability for a variety of reasons and then handle the individual without uh, a label um, okay. other than vulnerability. And I think that's an important strength. Can I go to alternatives to custody? And remind me, Margaret, your question was, if you're going to do that, what... 
Yes, it's, uh, it seems in prison then we're talking about routine um, screening. There's already a pilot giving some good practice. How much that's followed on with other um, NHS boards would be interesting, how, how much they've got this in the radar at all. But particularly if it's a non-custodial sentence, where do we start to identify this, let alone do something to intervene and treat? Thank you, Professor McMillan. And then I'll take Dr Aldrich, yes. <coughs> Professor McMillan, sorry. I think you, you have to distinguish, uh, again, in terms of the severity of the injury. So if um, the injury has been severe and is, is essentially disabling in terms of the person's daily life, then very likely what would be, would be required to, um, to effect a change is a period of inpatient rehabilitation. And if the disabilities are largely cognitive and, and emotional, the best evidence base for creating a change is a, a holistic forms of uh, neurobehavioural re rehabilitation. So I think if it was a severe injury, that would be the route that one would think of going down. If the injury has uh, had a, a less disabling effect on the person's lifestyle, <clears throat> You then may be looking at more of uh, uh, an education-based um, program of intervention. And we're hopefully going to be, uh, well, we are going to be looking at piloting a feasibility study in Polmont, um, uh, which would be a more of a generic system, which is based on a, a cognitive behavioural therapy model that um, has been developed by uh, Professor Chris Williams at University of Glasgow, um, and which focuses really in, in uh, uh, changing people's attitudes towards their lifestyle, but has a theoretical basis for doing that. And that's a group-based program which potentially uh, many people could access um, and doesn't require um, uh, clinically trained staff to, to provide it. So we're hoping to do a feasibility study on that. Could be a timing for that, please. Is there dates and um, we're, timeline uh, we've, for it? I've been to meet the governor, and we're, Press Williams and I are going back to Parliament in a couple of weeks' time to discuss further uh, initiating a feasibility study. Yeah, that's a kind of prison-based setting, but yeah. I wonder then if the um, pilot might concentrate on remand prisoners who may also be given when they, they can't, they might you know, be released, they might be uh, given a non-custodial sentence, if it could try and identify these, because it's the non-custodial uh, sentences. How do you identify them? Where are they screened? Well, I think identifying them is, is an issue that that type of programme um, is, is a programme which hasn't been developed specifically for prisons, so potentially that kind of programme would work. Uh, uh, for people who are, who are not going to custodial, uh, custodial centres. Identifying um, the people would be a matter of having um, a screening system um, which could pick up people who potentially uh, uh, have had a brain injury. But this, this kind of intervention would be suitable not just for people who've had a brain injury uh, um, because, as we've said, it, it, it's a complicated picture and uh, it would be suitable also for people who may have drug abuse and other issues. And, uh, convener, are, are we moving to routine testing in the criminal justice in, uh, system for brain injury, traumatic brain injury, just as a matter of course, to identify these when people whenever they come in contact with the criminal well, justice I, I think system? it would be a good, a good step. Yeah. Okay. Dr Aldridge. I think that... Um, it's very possible and desirable for people to be managed on community sentences uh, with this kind of condition. We're talking a lot about rehabilitation, um, but we mustn't forget that people's functioning is often uh, affected on a global level and they may become fairly vulnerable. And some of the intervention which you may be looking at is really helping to support people to access and maintain housing and tenancies and benefits, etc. It's not all focused directly on, on, on the rehabilitation. And the committee is quite good at that. I mean, we do understand, particularly with, say, with women offenders, we've looked at all these issues. Yeah, and it is Simple an issue practical for... practical things like having a roof over your head and your benefits arriving in time and so on. Uh, Stability. Absolutely, and I think you're right to point that out, that Scotland, you know, that the that a lot of good work is being done. And I think a lot of that can be done well within a community uh, sentence. And we certainly identify people 
on a, on a court-mandated community-based drug treatment program with, with head injuries. It's, there's absolutely no reason why that kind of screening can't take place. I'll take, I've got Professor Williams and Dr Neil on the same topic, is it? That's right. Um, and then I'm back to your question, Alison. Right. I, I think, um, uh, as, as Superintendent Allen kind of mentioned, that the, that the police have a way of, of understanding when someone is vulnerable is, is excellent, because that can, um, adapt, that can um, flag up across the system as somebody's coming into the criminal justice system that there's an issue here. Um, uh, we are trying to uh, enable probation staff, obviously that's rather tricky, um, around p picking up on the issue, both magistrates and judges, so that they can make ch the decisions around what will be the best placement uh, for somebody in terms of their um, ability to change behaviour. And so if you um, w were to start to have screening tools that were associated with with um, identifying a vulnerability and a screening tool around kind of identifying kind of range, then that would inform your judicial process as to whether somebody can um, participate in the, in the judicial process, understand what's, what, um, what's actually happening around them, um, and, uh, and also understand what the consequences uh, uh, is of the sentence they've been given, be it community or, or custodial. So I think it's of a, it's a paramount importance to be able to put some screens in early on and linking with the police systems. I was just thinking that we could have done perhaps with somebody from the social work system as well, which is sort of missing in this, who are often in the front line and um, meeting people who have got behaviour that's challenging for various reasons. Um, I don't know if we did we ask. We did ask. We did ask, yes. So that's, I think that's perhaps a little thing that's missing. I've got Dr Neil. Mm -hmm. um, if uh, behaviour is identified as, as problematic um, and, and causes an offence, then that's referred to as neurobehavioural disability if there is a brain injury associated with it. So if we can identify these vulnerable offenders who potentially have this kind of neurobehavioural disability, thankfully the provision of the kind of holistic neurobehavioural rehab that uh, Professor Macmillan referred to in Scotland is growing. So we've uh, for many years had Dr Carson service at the uh, Robert Ferguson unit and now the Brain Injury Rehabilitation Trust also runs a unit in Glasgow providing this kind of holistic, evidence-based um, intervention. The um, various studies that have been ca carried out on the cost-effectiveness of this show, um, in terms of the functional gains of life skills that these people can gain, a kind of lifetime saving of between 1.3 and 1.8 million in their lifetime care costs. So it's kind of re-equipping people with skills that uh, they may have lost as a result of the injury or never for, uh, because of um, their adverse social uh, experiences in early life never really developed. Can you tell me about this 1.8 million? What does that relate to? Sorry. Is that one, one individual <laughs> or what? I mean, it's a lot of money. I just want to know what it is. Well, if you have neurobehavioural disability, it is very cost... Your, the cost of your care is very high thereafter because you have to be... Um, kept safe and other people around you need to be kept safe from your behaviour. So if people are admitted to one of these services, can kind of have their behaviour um, ameliorated, then their lifetime care costs are less. Now these are people who have maybe not ended up in the criminal justice system or may have past histories of uh, criminal justice um, service use, but um, either way, these are two studies carried out by uh, Adi and Ramos, uh, which I can supply to, to the uh, committee if you're interested, or Worthington at all. I'm just interested, as always, governments have to look at money. And <laughs> if, it's in, you know, if it's putting preventative and you're even spending more to prevent people going into the criminal justice system and, and re-offending re and so on, uh, you're saving to the public purse. Not shouldn't be the basic reason for it, but it's very helpful. So just, if you introduce a figure like 1.8 million, you can see the public going, 1.8 million to save one person or something, you know, is a lot of money. That's not what you're saying, no, of I'm course. I'm saying no. these are the likely savings or that were the lifetime care costs of someone with neurobehavioural disability. Okay. Uh, Mr. Gentleman. Thank you. Uh, I simply wanted to expand on that point. I agree with what Dr. Dr. O'Neill's just said, but there's been a wealth of evidence for something like 30 years, a lot of it from the USA, admittedly, but also increasingly from other countries, that says basically that if you invest money in rehabilitation services, however defined, and that would include the social and housing rehabilitation we've been mentioning, then you, you get, in a sense, the money uh, recouped within three to five years afterwards because you convert somebody who is dependent into someone 
someone who's independent and, you know, in, in, in the best case scenario, you convert someone uh, back into a wage earning taxpayer. Um, the difficulty sometimes is that it's different pots of money. You know, someone has to spend the money for someone else to recoup the benefit later on. Um, and joined up thinking would help, I think, a good deal to make the economic argument for rehabilitation and clear. The government's moving in, moving yes. in that direction I, I with regard to looking at the holistic yes. spend rather than yeah. the yeah. various silo spend. Yes. I've got uh, Professor Williams. I'm getting to your question, Alison. Professor Williams, Dr Aldridge and Dr Carson after that. Just to make a point in the context of preventative uh, uh, economics, <laughs> um, uh, it seems to be that uh, reoffending costs about ten billion pounds a year. And to you, ten billion pounds to a year which to, to country? The, to the UK government. To the UK. Yes, yeah. we need the Scottish figures. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I wonder what the Scottish figures are, but that's the figure from uh, Right Honourable Christopher Grayling last year. Um, yeah. uh, somewhere between seven to thirteen billion. Um, and if you uh, then look at where does that, if you then start to think about what does a reoffending person look like? Well, they look like people that we've been talking about. Uh, brain injuries will be a big factor in there. Alcohol and drugs issues will be a big factor. All the web of risk factors. But it seems to be that brain injury is a keystone condition with, within that. That's why um, some preventative spending around um, uh, identifying and managing brain injury, particularly early on, may bring along some health, uh, some, some economic kind of benefit down the line. Thank you. Dr. Aldridge. I think that um, if I go back to my clinic this afternoon and identify someone with this kind of level of problem, uh, by the time they, if I then make a referral, it can be several months before that appointment is offered. If they happen to miss that appointment, um, then it may be another sort of four months or so before they, they get an offer of an outpatient assessment. And in between that time, we need to try to stabilise their, their drug use. So I think it feels like an under-resourced area. And when I'm, if I'm sitting in my clinic this afternoon with someone like that, it's probably going to be a year or so before I can get them almost to their first appointment with, with neuro-rehabilitation services, even for their assessment. It just takes that long, and so it feels under-resourced. Dr Carson? I'm just going to make that point with some Scottish figures. Um, again, as part of its general programme for trying to improve head injury care in Scotland, Savin's putting forward a, a comprehensive proposal. And in the rehabilitation aspect of that, we would estimate that Scotland should have about 400 rehabilitation beds with associated outside services. It has 120 and some areas are severely under-resourced in terms of community service at all, let alone adequate service, so that there is a huge gap. If, however, one's going then to talk about custodial diversion, um, there is a separate issue about um, the containment depending on the severity of the crime. There are currently very few forensic beds in Scotland for brain injured offenders. My unit's probably the only unit of the brain injury units in Scotland that occasionally take brain injured <coughs> offenders, but we come into security problems because we're not a secure unit, we're a rehab unit. The majority of the medium secure forensic psychiatry facilities do not take brain injury as a matter of policy. The state hospital does, but there is, there is a massive gap in provision and there is also a problem with the compulsory aspect of treatment in that most of the studies quoted are on people who are volunteering for treatment and at least willing to engage, albeit I fully agree with all the cognitive difficulties can get in the way. But that's before you start looking at using the Mental Health Act or the criminal provisions of it to divert them. And then it gets very complicated. Um, so it's, it's not straightforward, it's, again, just the point to make. Ms Parker, I'll take you, then I'll take Alison to repeat your question again, and then I'm going to do a, a wind-up of the session. Yes. SPS experience in making referrals to health boards for assessment for prisoners identified with traumatic uh, brain injury have also evidenced up to 12 months of huge resource implications across health boards in Scotland. Thank you. And Alison, can you remind us of your 
Well, I've been Mainly because I've written it down, I can't read my handwriting <laughs> anymore. I mean, that's, that's what I'm asking you. I suppose I'd been um, keen to find out how successful cognitive rehabilitation was. I think Dr Brian O'Neill and, and Professor Williams and, and, and Mr Gentleman have, have touched on that, but what's more clear is actually it's seriously under-resourced, and, yeah. and we're just talking about cranking up um, this. So I think that's the main message. I'm not yeah. sure there's anything more to be added to that. I, I think the question for us is where would the resources come from and, and, and spend to save um, thing. Now, I'm going to wind up now because I, I would like each person, this is not a parlour game, but I'd like each person, as we're going to consider if and where we take this, if there's one key point, and I mean one key point, that you'd wish us to consider in a recommendation, as it were, to take forward and to, 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 to one thing. I know that's not fair, really, but then that's not why I'm sitting here. I'm not going to be fair, because it, but we've, we have a short time, as you know, we have a gap. We're able to do this discussion, but if you had one thing you want to take home, and I think we're beginning to get some of them now um, after the broad discussion, what would it be and who would like to start? You don't, I won't go round in order, but if you just nominate yourselves, you only get one bite at this. Chair, yes. I'm confident my colleagues will uh, add in other things that would be on my list, but I think one place we need to start is with a comprehensive epidemiological study that would give us uh, uh, good information about uh, head injury throughout the prisons in Scotland okay. and the relationship to offending. Thank you very much. Now, who else wants to give me one? Yes, Dr McFarland. I think the epidemiology study would be key to that, but I also think some teaching and training for staff to increase, increase awareness would help improve prisoner wellbeing. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Um, both identification of uh, brain injury in, in offenders and the provision of training uh, has been carried out by the Disabilities Trust using link workers who uh, go into the prisons to train and help people identify vulnerable offenders. So your recommendation is more link workers? More link workers. Yes, if we could just, yeah, thank you. Yes, Ms Parker. When, when focusing on, on prisoners and screening and rehabilitation, I would, uh, my wish would be for continuity of care to ensure that we have that community reintegration package right and that if we're looking at rehabilitation centres, that we've got that consistency across Scotland. Thank you. Right, can I have some? Yes, uh, Mr, uh, Mr Gentleman. Yes, Thank sorry. You. Um, many years of running a brain injury rehabilitation unit as a doctor have taught me that if you look at only the medical or the clinical issues, you'll miss a lot of the picture. And I would put in a plea for more resourcing of the resettlement of offenders in the community to reduce the risk of reoffending and to provide with better qualities of life if possible. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Carson. Than the one I was going to give you. I'll, actually. Let, you think, I'll let you think of another one. I'm well, sure you can pluck another one out. What I was going to say is that I would like to look at what we can do about secure beds for patients with known very severe brain injuries that have committed significant crimes or are in the criminal justice system and are currently impossible to place within Scotland. Thank you. That's, these are all good points. Uh, Superintendent Allen. I think it links very much to the, the lack of available services, and that was this week's publication by HMIC of a review of police custody, and that highlighted the challenges of appropriate mental health service access once people are identified as needing it, and in terms of a potential beneficiary of any increased spend, it would probably be us that would reap the savings as well as the overall public purse, but I would have to support the mental health services as in need of additional funding. Thank you very much. Others, please. Professor Williams. I'm sure the point has been made about screening. Uh, screening is, a, is an incredibly important point, so I won't make that point. Um, but uh, what I would uh, wish for would be some preventative action around childhood brain injuries. To pick up on childhood brain injuries more effectively, the linkages between a &E departments, GP practices and schools to enable better reintegration of children at risk back into schools. And in so doing, they, they're in schools rather than down the line in prisons. Thank you. Um, uh, some people not, somebody not giving me something yet. Dr Aldridge and then uh, Dr McFarland, have you? You have, sorry, Dr Aldridge. Well, I, I think that um, in terms of prevention, I, I, 
I really think that this does feed into the sort of agenda of, of um, minimum pricing for alcohol, for instance, to try to reduce availability of that, because that feeds into the kind of risk factors associated with getting a head injury in the first place, I think, and for more resource and awareness to be directed at that sort of uh, issue. The causations? Yeah. Yes. Well, can I, can I say, well, you've written a, re a little report for us. We don't need to sit afterwards. I've got all the points there. I thought I'd save you the time. Can I thank you very much for your very valuable time and uh, for extremely interesting, as always, uh, to have roundtable discussions and to hear across the spectrum. Thank you very much. And we will, I think, you'll, we'll find out what we're going to be doing with it in due course. But it certainly, I don't think we'll stop here. Thank you. I'm going to suspend till 11.10. Thank you.
much. Um, our next item of business is another one off roundtable se evidence session, this time on environmental crime and its connections to serious organised crime and money laundering. I welcome every participant to this session and thank you very much for written submissions. I don't know if you've all been at a roundtable in Parliament before. No. So what I will do is, um, first of all, I'm going to go around everybody to introduce themselves and then this is a chance to keep the politicians silent which takes some doing, but we will do it. And I also welcome Graham Day. I'm not saying you have to be silent all the time, Graham. They'll make a nice change because he's my neighbour in Parliament. Um, uh, what I will do is let mainly it's interaction between witnesses because it's a, a, a listen and learn for the politicians. I have two lists. I have my yellow list, which is witnesses of priority. And as my committee know, they're on the pink list, which means they are in the B plan here. But we try to get through as much as possible. We've always found it extremely useful, as we did the last session. Uh, can I welcome you for also giving up your time and can I ask uh, people to introduce yourself? I'm Christine Graham, MSP, and it's because you all said it before, I'm going to say I'm the MSP from Midlothian South, Tweeddale and Lauderdale, bit of a mouthful but wonderful place, and I convene the committee. I'm uh, Elaine Murray, MSP for Adam Freesha, and I'm the vice convener of the committee. Good morning. I'm oh, sorry, meant to say your lights will come on automatically. <laughs> Just Put your hand, let me know that you want to be called. I'll let you know and I'll call you and your light will go on. little red light will go on. And so when it's on, be discreet. Don't say anything about your neighbour you wouldn't wish to be said in public. I'm looking at myself. Yes. Good morning. I'm Katrina Darrymple, the Head of Policy for the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. Margaret Mitchell, Member of the Justice Committee and MSP for Central Scotland. Uh, Stephen Freelance from the Scottish Environmental Services Association, which is a trade body for the waste industry. Uh, I'm Roderick Campbell, MSP for North East Fife and a member of the Justice Committee. Good morning, I'm Linda Ovens. I'm the Chair of the Scottish Centre of the Chartered Institution of Waste Management, the professional body for the Institute. Good morning, Christian Arad, uh, MSP for the North East of Scotland and member of the Committee. And my morning, John Finney, MSP Highlands and Islands and Committee member. Uh, Graeme Day, I'm MSP for Angus South, and I'm here as Deputy Convener of the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee. I'm John Mundell, Chief Executive of In Inverclyde Council. I'm here representing SOLAS, which is the Society of Local Authority Chief Executives, and I'm the Portfolio Lead on Environment, Sustainability and Waste Management. Sandra White, MSP for Glasgow Kelvin, and a member of the committee. Good morning, Gary Mitchell, with Detective Chief Inspector within Police Scotland Organised Crime Counterterrorism Unit. Good morning, Rhoda Nicholson, Assistant Chief Constable, Organised Crime, Counterterrorism and Safer Communities. Good morning, Alison McInnes, MSP for North East Scotland and Member of the Justice Committee. Good morning, William Wilson, National Operations Waste and Enforcement Manager for SEPA. John Pentland, Member of the uh, Scottish Parliament for Mull Mushaw and a Member of the Justice Committee. <coughs> Good morning. I'm Callum MacDonald, uh, an Executive Director with SEPA and uh, Chairman of the Environmental Crime Task Force established in 2012. I'm now conscious that Mr Day has come with his title with him as Deputy Convener of the Envi Rural Development and Environment Committee. So we're directing it to links with crime, so we'll not tread on toes, we hope. And I think just as a general question to start people off is to say, why on earth should one link serious organised crime and environmental waste and crime like that. I mean, the public would say, what's this all about, Alfie? And I'm asking you, who wants to start? You look a man ready at the starting gate, ACC um, Nicholson. You yeah. are ready there, yes. I, I can start, yeah, absolutely no problem at all. But, uh, Organised crime is involved in, any, in every facet of uh, Scot Scottish life, um, so they will be involved in environmental crime like they are involved in any other kind of criminality. They'll try to get involved in legitimate business. Uh, they'll try to undermine legitimate business, which is a, a key component of uh, what we're going to talk about today, no doubt. Uh, and as I say, uh, we've done data sweep sweeps. We do that quarterly to have a real understanding of what organised crime is involved in. We've got roughly about 220 organised crime groups in Scotland. There's about 3,500 members. We know at this point in time that the involvement in environmental crime has been growing. When we looked at 2012, we, we think it was about 1.3 per cent. Come on to 2014, we think it's about 4 per cent. We think now there's about 10 organised crime groups involved to some degree in environmental crime. So uh, very, very important in terms of, uh, of how we take this forward. 
they don't adhere to legislation, they don't adhere to regulation, uh, that then is a competitive advantage because they can compete with le legitimate business, they can undercut legitimate business, uh, and fairly obviously that's what we want uh, ultimately to stop, and we want to stop the difficulties there are from uh, what they undertake, so dumping waste, uh, toxic waste into landfill sites, and a whole range of different things that save them finance. Uh, that, uh, that causes difficulty for the environment and, uh, and other parts of the economy. So uh, that would be the starting point. And I appreciate for reasons of prosecution and things, you can't name names and we accept that. Yeah. Um, who wants to come? Mr MacDonald. Yeah, I, I would agree with everything that, that uh, Ruri has just said. Um, uh, there's a very low barrier to entry into the waste industry for um, organised criminals. Um, and the benefits, the potential benefits for them are huge. Um, and uh, there's, there's little to uh, dissuade them from becoming involved in this, and there are really high rewards. Yes, Ms. Evans. You know, that, that's, that's increasing. The cost of being compliant within our industry um, is increasing with um, taxes and requirements to separate waste and new regulations coming in require more people to do more things which which has has a cost impact and and provides a, a wider envelope if you like to to operate below that yes mr wilson uh, in addition to what linda's just said there um organized crime as we mentioned is dynamic flexible in, in their in way they operate um so they are quite adept at putting up a legal facade uh, putting in um, the, uh, the, uh, the impression of uh, compliance, uh, but sitting behind that is the underlying motive of gaining money, uh, not adhering to the uh, environmental uh, uh, requirements that are uh, applicable to them, but at the same time uh, undercutting legitimate business and effectively uh, not allowing a level playing field to, uh, to, to operate. I've got no other witnesses on my list, so John, you want to ask a question, John Finney? Uh, thank you, Convener. It's, it's a point you start off initially with, and uh, I wonder the extent to which the, uh, the Convener talked about public awareness. Public awareness is terribly important. You know, whether it's someone undertaking repairs or renovations on your house and knowing what, what would be done to, to uh, understand that the, the waste that comes from that has been properly disposed of. Has, has there been any campaign or could there be some sort of collective action? I appreciate a lot of the, the, the stuff you, you talk about, Mr Wilson, there. There's been a legitimate front to it and it might not be obvious, but some raising of public awareness because uh, I think that's terribly important. Yes. sought to engage with the industry and with those who are involved in that infrastructure, uh, supplying haulage and moving um, waste uh, to and fro various sites and so on. Um, the, the underlying evidence is that prices are too good to be true, uh, and we have to get that out to the industry, and we've sought to do that. Uh, there is a duty of care on the industry in, the, in terms of its movement of waste uh, back and forth, uh, but we now, I think, uh, need to reach out to the public. Uh, because it does start at some point, and it starts certainly in the private sector and the, and the public local authority sector. We are reaching through uh, and through the work we're doing with uh, John Mandel and the local authorities. We will be reaching out to them, but now is the time to reach to the public uh, and put this message across. I'll take Ms. Evans, then Mr. Mandel, and on my, on my um, members list, I've got Margaret, Elaine, Christian, and Sandra. Right, Ms. Evans. So I would say that um, public awareness is increasing. We've just had nat National Litter Week. Um, huge litter campaigns and the public is very aware of um, fly tipping incidents and the small scale crime um, that, that is, is kind of ongoing but I think what, what we're looking at today is, is a level above that is, is the organisations that the, the organised organisations that, yes, we're, not, we're not on fly tipping and litter sure. we, so we're, we're the public into are, toxic waste and so on, that's what we want to hear about yeah, yes. so the public are very aware of the, the low level if you like, uh, criminality uh, but not, not what we're talking about today. On this issue, um, this is still on publicity and so on. I've got John Mundell and Mr. McDonald back in again. And Graeme, you're on my list. 
Thank you. Uh, the public invariably are the people who identify problems with uh, uh, dumping or whatever, and they're usually the ones where they've uh, witnessed increased volumes of traffic going to particular sites who very often report these things at the moment. However, uh, there are a number of campaigns that have uh, been undertaken up till now. For example, the Dumb Dumpers campaign, which is run by Keep Scotland Beautiful, uh, and some of these uh, campaigns have been on the television, that type of thing, to raise awareness. Uh, and obviously, you, you said that you don't want to deal with fly tipping, which you can understand, but there are varying degrees. Uh, there are small incidents, maybe a, a, an individual householder, up to building businesses, which again is a form of crime as far as I'm concerned, where there may be dumping materials, which could, can include asbestos, and it may well just be in a field entrance. But nonetheless, the issues of dealing with that are just the same, uh, perhaps on a smaller scale, than dealing with major sites. So. Not disputing that for a moment, yeah. that it can be just somebody dumping a mattress or a whole lot of waste that's being fly-tipped on maybe um, farmland. But we're looking specifically at serious organised crime, which is under the carpet, under a blanket okay. that we don't know about. And that's where we want to get publicity for this. And what publicity is there out to the public and perhaps to other agencies who are the big the people who give the contracts out, like local authorities and health boards, that's the real. They've got the contracts for real being. So that's the kind of thing I think that John, what, what information and publicity are they getting to know when they get bids in, who's behind the bid? So I'll now take. Um, sorry? Yeah, I know, but I'm going to take witnesses first. Just I'm Christian, I know, but I'll take the witnesses first. So I've got that. Mr. Mundell, you've. You've done your bit there, so I want to talk to Mr. MacDonald. Is that along the lines of the large yes. agencies? Absolutely. Um, so uh, I would say that public awareness is low. Um, but John is also right that it's often members of the public that draw illegal activity to our, to our attention. But amongst the public, um, there's a very low awareness that, that organised crime is involved in this, in this particular industry. And I think it's probably also fair to say that um, awareness amongst um, many responsible authorities is pretty low, but growing now. Um, and uh, you know, the, the different people that you've got around the table um, have been meeting and discussing this issue uh, with a view to um, working cooperatively. And that includes um, the, the legitimate end of the industry in, in the shape of um, uh, Linda and, and Stephen Freeland, the, the, the trade body and the professional body. Do you want to come in there, Mr Freeland? I think that's your cue. Yeah, I think um, one of the, the least well-known victims of this is uh, the regulated and legitimate industry. Uh, if we don't make uh, greater efforts to clamp down on environmental crime uh, and the, the serious organised criminals involved in this, materials can be diverted away from regulated sites uh, we've got our members who are committing to multi-million pound developments on new facilities uh, in, um, to meet the zero waste plan objectives. Uh, why would they want to invest, risk all that money, if there's no guarantee they're going to get a return? Uh, so for me, the, 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 weak, the weakest link in this whole supply chain is on the, the waste producer uh, the, the high street business, who has been bombarded now with a whole lot of regulations, and this is all, we fully support the regulatory framework, it needs to drive up improvements and raise standards. Uh, that invariably comes with an additional cost. Uh, if they're unaware of their, regu uh, their regulatory requirements, and somebody comes along and is able to offer a cut market price, uh, there's a temptation to use that. So the thing is that the, the, the existing framework, the existing duty of care has been for 20 years. It's an existing requirement. It just, I think, needs to be uh, strongly enforced, strongly looked at, and a, a better understanding of this information that comes through the duty of care. Uh, I'll take you, Graham. then I'll take Margaret, then Elaine, and put Margaret and Elaine's questions together like last time. So, Graham. Uh, uh, thank you, Camino. I was just struck by a comment in the, ev the written evidence of Mr Mundell's organisation where he talked about the constraints of EU procurement regulations on councils. I just wondered, given this partnership approach that's been taken to tackle this issue, what actually needs to be done to put councils in a better place to ensure that they are not giving contracts to organisations like these? Who wants to take that one up? Mr Mundell. Uh, thank you. Uh, the primary control uh, a council has 
and checking uh, uh, suppliers or whatever is through the tendering process. And at the moment, a, can a council cannot legally disbar a supplier or a tenderer, indeed, from submitting a, a, a tender to a council for particular works, and we will be dealing with their domestic waste stream, disposing of that, uh, based on uh, purely intelligence from the police. Now, the Environmental Crime Task Force is sharing on an increasing scale intelligence, which is hugely helpful. And I have to say I'm feeling very positive about the, the workings of the Environmental Crime Task Force in that regard, because HMRC, police, SEPA, so on and so forth, are all sharing that data border, uh, the border agency as well. Uh, so that's hugely helpful. However, uh, we are barred from excluding a tenderer if there, are, there have been no formal criminal convictions. These convictions could be anything from uh, corruption, bribery and corruption, through common law uh, type uh, legislation. And if there have not been any convictions, it really makes it extremely difficult for us to bar these very sophisticated organisations from tendering or indeed awarding a tender to these uh, uh, suppliers. If in the event, during the term of an awarded contract, we come across evidence that proves that a supplier has not declared any criminal uh, convictions prior to the tender stage or at the time of award, we can actually cease that contract immediately without any uh, recourse to uh, compensation for that supplier. So there are rules and regulations there. The difficulty is uh, getting the intelligence. The Environmental Crime Task Force at the moment are, are uh, improving our information sharing protocols at the moment, which is hugely helpful. And again, that's not easy either. That's quite complex to achieve uh, effective, uh, fast-tracked information sharing. Thank you, Convener. I was just going to ask you, do the criminal convictions have to be relevant to the nature of the contract? Because we're talking about money laundering uh, often. You no know, dirty money being put literally into another um, so-called legit business. Can it be any kind of criminal uh, convictions? And how do you get behind the facade of individuals and the legal status of a company? I mean, it's quite difficult technically, legally. How, how would you... It's extremely difficult, and I'm certainly no expert uh, with regard to the different uh, forms of legislation in that regard. But uh, there are common law powers. Uh, uh, I've mentioned them already. In fact, there's a whole long list. Cheating the revenue, uh, HMRC, uh, failing to pay VAT. These types of con convictions are, are all very relevant, uh, and indeed they probably exist on a great, great scale with serious organised crime. I'm trying to get to the point, though, is it convictions? Perhaps the ACC can help me. Convictions yeah. to individuals... Yeah. Or how do you do that? Link that to the <laughs> a company name, which the, has you know the the, it's the veil difficult. of a different identity. It's extremely difficult, and many of the individuals that we're talking about wouldn't have any criminal convictions. They'll keep themselves distanced from from all of that. Uh, however, however, we will have uh, intelligence that we would want to share. That becomes very, very difficult. And even if we do share it, there's no confidence in being able to use that and the litigation that, that might follow. So we need, we need to find ways of sharing intelligence that doesn't amount to a conviction. Conviction straightforward, fairly obviously. But if we've got intelligence that, uh, depending on what the source of that intelligence is, we legally cannot share at this moment in time. So we need to find ways of changing that uh, in the future that gives confidence to councils, for instance, and other bodies in terms of uh, refusing to give contracts to the kind of uh, businesses, organisations and individuals that we're actually talking about today. And we'll maybe come back. Mr Wilson, I'll let other members in now. Mr Wilson, after you. Uh, just to sort of broaden that uh, issue out, um, as an agency, we're also constrained with the current legislation in terms of the issue of licences and permits. Uh, we have fit and proper person tests, but in terms of convictions, they're limited to environmental convictions, or they are concerned around financial provision or technical competency. Uh, we are looking at legislation just now through the, the Regulatory Reform Act and looking at the area of fit and proper person, but it's piercing that corporate veil is the problem, because sitting behind whatever condition of fit and proper person we put up, we may still have intelligence that, despite all that, the company is merely a facade. Uh, and we are left with the position of what do we do as an agency. If all the boxes have been ticked, how do we stop this from happening? Ms Dalrymple, this is for the Crown Office to come in, I think. Thank you. Um, it, as ACC Nicholson identified, it is um, the, the issue of converting the intelligence 
into evidence that can be then led in court in, in order to obtain a successful conviction. Um, and there is quite a lot of case law in, in, in the United Kingdom in relation to piercing the corporate veil and looking behind the company um, if it is being utilised for sham purposes. Um, and we certainly are completely committed to working with all the different agencies to, to try and secure these convictions when, when the evidence is there. Um, Piercing the corporate veil um, is also very, very relevant when we're looking at um, assets and we're looking at the utilisation of the proceeds of crime because that's another tool that we can use in terms of successfully trying to combat the serious and organised crime group infiltration. Um, and we certainly um, will do everything we can to work with all the different agencies to make sure that we identify the benefits and the assets that can be restrained and then the assets that can hopefully be confiscated at a later stage. But it's complex to It is to complex deal with and it requires companies. a multi agency approach. That, 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 that's the yeah. key here. And, and we have already established very, very good links. And we have dedicated people working with um, all the agencies around the table. Mr. Wilson, and then I'll take in uh, Margaret and Elaine. Mr. Wilson. You'd be very interested in learning more and participating in any consultation around the second group. Um, uh, legislation that came out for uh, the Procurement Reform Scotland Act that uh, gave assent in June of this year. Um, because that seems to be an area that we could um, provide some experience on in terms of if we could uh, uh, pass on some of the, the issues that we have and see whether they have some relevance to, to that legislation and, uh, uh, while it's still in that draft form. Let's take Margaret and Elaine. If you can give your questions, please, Margaret. Yeah. Um, just concentrating on the awareness um, just to the public generally of an individual crime, say, fly tipping and organised crime for fly tipping and, and other activities that's very lucrative. Um, just to what extent is the taxpayer aware of the, the cost to their pocket and how much could be made of that to try and get mm. them to be um, more aware of possible um, sources of intelligence that they could give? For example, the clean-up rate, the costs of... Um, all of that for various breaches, the actual investigation itself and the, um, the, the prosecution. And also, how do we address the leniency that seems to be um, apparent in sentencing? And has the Crown and Procurator Fiscal got any particular specialism here in environmental crimes that, that could help? And the last bit, I think, is the duty of care for businesses and companies. Um, enough to make them aware that if it's cut price and it sounds too good to be true, it almost is, and you're almost uh, in danger and fear of being prosecuted, and that's going back to the leniency of sentencing again. That was clever. That was three questions. <laughs> uh, they're too cute for me in here. Elaine, I'm going to get the pile of questions and I put uh, that there. My interest was also in deterrence. Um, clearly, there's... Uh, Two aspects to that. One is whether or not you're actually going to be found out, and obviously you've been already touched on some of the joint working that's been done around that. But I was also interested as, uh, in uh, the uh, CSA's evidence that suggested that, as Margaret says, that the sentencing was leniency, and whether or not actually the punishments that are available actually fit the crimes, or do we need to address that? Right. So I have. Um, to what extent is the public aware of the overall costs, clean up, everything that happens that hits their pockets? Do we have any figures for that? And um, leniency in sentencing, is that part of the punishment not fitting the crime? Are there specialists in the Crown Office in environmental crime? And the information or duty of care to businesses and companies that they, if they're party to it, or they turn a blind eye or they don't make too much of an inquiry, there's some kind of you know, um, good comeuppance for them. So I'll start off, first of all, to with the to overall cost. Does anybody get any figures to give us? It's quite a tough one, but somebody can... Yes, Mr Freeland. Yeah, um, as I say, this is very, very hard to quantify. Uh, the, the ESA Educational Trust uh, did a, a report, which I think you probably uh, circulated and seen uh, earlier on this year, that tried to quantify this. Is it a UK level rather than a Scottish level? Uh, and obviously the, the figures were uh, set to a range of different variables, but they did suggest uh, an overall cost of about £570 million pounds a year. Uh, and breaking that down um, to uh, £157 million pounds of that was through uh, evasion of landfill tax. Uh, and the rest split between fly tipping £186 million, and the rest on actually 
dealing with the illegal sites. Those you know about. Yes. Those, mm. those you don't know about. Yes, anybody else want to come on the cost? Yes, thank you, Mr Wilson. Yeah, just in terms of the cases that we cannot go into in detail for, for obvious reasons because they're, they're live, um, the financial benefit that we have seen in terms of that, which the vast majority of which is made up of tax evasion, between 80 and 90 per cent, um, we provided some written evidence that stated it was £27 million. Well, since we submitted that, the figure has risen to £29 million. Now, 90 per cent of that current figure for these cases is uh, around tax. Um, is the public aware of that? No. Um, uh, is it, I think the question ought to be asked, should there be more public awareness in this area? Uh, definitely. Um, this is theft from the public purse, uh, pure and simple, um, and it's not going back into the purse. It's not been uh, used for the, for the operation of the government. Um, Have you included the cost of detection and all the surveillance in that figure? I mean, uh, that's just clean-up. We're talking this, about the total that, cost, the efforts of trying to do it. So somebody got figures for that. <coughs> so that that's not clean-up cost. That is the financial benefit that the individuals and companies themselves okay, have okay. Um, The clean-up costs are substantial. Um, we, again, without going into the details, the figures will run for these cases if we go into well into uh, millions and millions of pounds. Um, there are cases that I think have been submitted and written the submission from the Northern Irish experience in that, and the figures there are startling. Um, we have to combat this. We have to bring an awareness to the public, to the government, that this is a serious issue. I move uh, to the second question. As nobody else has come in about the cost, about it, leniency in sentencing. Um, who wants to comment on that? You feel that there's not the punishment doesn't fit the crime. We can't ask the crown officer. <laughs> they're not allowed to do talk about that. But is there anybody who or not the police can any any views from local authorities who've got the burden perhaps of doing all this, or do no comment? Feel free, be bold, this is your chance. Yes, you go for it, Ms. Evans. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you, you just go for it. Let's have that. <laughs> you think it's leniency instead. Everybody seems to be very coy about that question. Yes. Um, I, think, I think just in terms of awareness to, to say that uh, I don't, it's not just the general public who um, don't have much understanding of, of the level of cost and the level of, of um, um, and finances involved in this. I think the industry do as well. I would say that our own industry is shocked when um, cases do come out and, and, and can be publicised, then the, the figures, the, the, the millions of pounds are, are shocking to the, the compliant industry as much as the public. Um, in, in terms of fines and leniency, then yes, we've seen, we've seen for years that... Um, um, fi fines are, are for specific environmental um, crimes such as fly tipping and, and, and um, we've seen in the, in the ESA report that, that was uh, provided today that um, the, the, the fines that, that are attributed to the cases in England in that report um, are far less than the actual cost of the tax evasion and the clean up and, and, the, and, the, and the, the legal costs to go with that These statutory fines or common law penalties imposed? Can somebody clarify for me? In my understanding, I'm not sure about England and Wales, but certainly in Scotland, um, if it's prosecuted under statutory legislation, then it would be a statutory, statutory fine. Statutory fines, yes. yes. Okay. We've got um, Mr MacDonald, yes. Um, uh, I'm certainly not going to uh, criticise the judiciary here and the levels of fines are entirely a matter for them. And if it's statutory... They are bound. That's why I asked the question. Yeah, yes. yeah. Um, but what I would say is that I think there is a trend which is, um, which is moving in the right direction. Um, just in recent years, um, cases that CEPA has brought to the courts have resulted in... Um, uh, I'll give you a few examples. One, um, a fine of £200,000, one, a custodial sentence for six months, um, and another one, a restriction of liberty order. And, and these, are all, these are all recent. Um, so I, I, I think there is a move which is in the right direction. Yes. And if I may add to, to um, Callum there, um, we do have a conviction um, last year where, in terms of environmental crime, there was the first confiscation order, so there was seizure of assets there, um, and that was £41,130 um, was seized off an individual or a company, I think it was. Can I go, because you're on yes. that, onto specialisms, because we know the Crown Office has specialised in trying to do wildlife crime and yes, environmental no, that, crimes that's right. I mean, expand? One of the strategic priorities for our organisation um, includes the prosecution of serious crime and the recovery of assets from those involved in criminal activities. 
Um, the Serious and Organised Crime Division was created in 2011, and that division is split into seven units. Um, we have the Proceeds of Crime Unit, the Economic Crime Unit, the International Cooperation Unit, the Wildlife and Environmental Crime Unit, the Organised Crime Unit and the Criminal Allegations Against the Police Unit. And we will be, in the course of this year, setting up a regulatory crime unit. So I think that demonstrates that within these units there are specialists. Um, the Proceeds of Crime Unit, for example, has about 19 or, or 20 members of staff within it that are working exclusively on seizure of assets in relation to the ongoing live investigations. And it, I was going to draw you in, ACC Nicholson, about specialisms within, obviously, it starts with, um, to some extent with you, the police. Yeah, exactly. So, um, fairly obviously, we've, well, we've, we, uh, or I, am the head of uh, organised crime and counterterrorism, safer communities, just uh, to add in some other bits and pieces. But, uh, and then we obviously adhere to the, uh, the Scottish Government's strategy in terms of um, letting our communities flourish and the, the four Ds, so um, detect, deter, disrupt and uh, divert. <laughs> four. <laughs> you did well to get three. <laughs> I, and, and fairly obviously then leads on each one of these um, that, um, that allow us to take this forward. Because at the end of the day, uh, once we're talking about fines, then we're probably at the wrong end of what we need to be doing here. So actually, in the, there's about £9 billion of public service contracts in Scotland. That's what we ought to be trying to protect. So we should have every single penny of that ought to be going to legitimate business. That, that ought to be the outcome of, uh, of what we try to, to do here and what we try to do collectively. So each agency here is working together. So, you know, Guard Kosh brings benefits in, in all the various agencies coming together. We've got uh, SEPA will be embedded into Guard Kosh just over the next three or four weeks. Uh, we've just signed an information sharing protocol with uh, SEPA. Myself and Calm signed that uh, in June. Um, and so uh, strides being made in terms of actually how to take, take this forward. But I think I come back to what, what I said earlier on uh, was in terms of intelligence sharing. So we would like to share much more intelligence uh, about what's going on, share it with SEPA fairly obviously, but also share it with local authorities because we know we know from our intelligence, uh, we, don't, we don't have the level of a conviction but we know from our intelligence that people are involved in serious organised crime. We know if they're involved in money laundering. Uh, and at times we can't share that level of intelligence with others when they could make decisions about whether having these organisations involved or not. Uh, and so we need to find ways of actually making it... Well, some, some intelligence that we, we gather is illegal to share with, uh, with other organisations. Some um, intelligence is not... at at that level of corroboration where uh, councils and others have confidence that they can actually take that Let's forward. Part the yeah. <laughs> hey, okay. we're, we're not allowed to use the C word in no, your corroboration, sorry. but can I just say to you, yep. you said, I understand that, but when you're yep. not so secure in it, and quite rightly local authorities, and I'm over, this is not this kind of dodgy information, it's not really sustained, but you said for other reasons you can't share. Now, what are those other reasons? Well, there's Without the, naming cases, obviously, no, no, what the, are the uh, other reasons? There's, there's uh, under uh, RIPA, uh, Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act Part 1, there's certain intelligence that we legally cannot share with anybody else. Um, and so, uh, but however, that intelligence would give us a confidence that organisations are involved in serious organised crime and we are not in a position that we can share that with other people to prevent I want to them. Sorry, I want to pursue, give us an example of something under RIPA that you can't <laughs> therefore share because that seems to be the whole problem for you. Yeah. Well, it would be intelligence at a very, very sensitive level um, that we can gather that we uh, are not in a position to share with, uh, with us. Our... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. exactly. Uh, so at, at the most sensitive level of intelligence gathering, then we cannot share. It's under the legislation. It's under RIPA Part 1, as I say, for, for instance. But there are, there is, there's other intelligence as well that we can't, uh, we can't give the social of. So... Uh, fairly obviously, legitimately, people in councils would want to know, well, what is the source of that intelligence? How can we rely on that intelligence? Well, we can tell you the intelligence, but we can't tell you the source of it and uh -huh. whatever yes, else. Then, okay. Now, so it's not that the intelligence wouldn't 
be um, it couldn't be relied on it. Most of the intel all the intelligence that we would give, we would suggest we can or you can rely on. However, sharing that, sharing the provenance of that, we cannot do, uh, and that causes a difficulty because when the council then goes forward, they get challenged in the courts, litigation, whatever else happens to be. They don't have the confidence in using that intelligence. They can't go back behind that to understand where it came from, and a whole range of issues. Now we've suggested the notion of an intelligence and information commissioner, high court judge or whoever else that might look at our intelligence and be able to give some form of certificate. I don't know, you know what that would look like, but nonetheless be able to say, yes, I've looked at the intelligence, I've looked at the sensitive intelligence, and I can tell you that that organisation is involved in serious organised crime. Uh, or, no, they're definitely not. They get a clean bill of health. That would give the various organisations the opportunity then to to uh, deal with that and make decisions around about whether, in fact, that organisation, that individual, could get the contract that they are uh, that they are trying to procure. So, so we th we think there are ways of moving forward. That we think that there are ways that we ought to be able to share more of, uh, of the intelligence that we hold, not only that we hold, but also that CEPA hold. Uh -huh. The local authorities themselves will hold mm -hmm. that can be shared more readily uh, as we as we move forward. Because back to what I said originally, this is about the £9 billion of public, you know, so we're, we're focusing today on environmental crime and I wholly understand that. However, as I said at the very start, a serious organised crime is involved in every facet of Scot Scottish life. So yes. uh, whether that's nurseries or whatever it no, happens to know, be. No, we know, we know. Care you know, homes, yeah. Exactly. So, yeah. so my, my plea here is that it, it needs to be broader. We need to, the public marketing of all of this needs to be about environmental crime. Of course it, it does. That's really important. But it's also important that the public understand the involvement from other uh, aspects of uh, of what organised crime are involved in. Now, we, from a police perspective, we, we do a lot of marketing. We go to the media. We, we promote success as we see success and whatever else happens to be. Uh, but anything that can be done to make sure that the public knows and understands uh, and actually doesn't buy into, if it's too good to be true, then it's going to be good. It's going to be too good to well, be true. Well, on that point, can I just stop yeah. there? Because I want to yeah. get on to the other questions. But you mentioned duty of care. Um, Margaret's question was about duty of care from the parties, you know, in, in issuing the contract. Um, does anyone want to comment on that? Perhaps from, I don't know if the Crown Office, if there's a role for the Crown Office at the end of the day there when someone willfully turns a blind eye or something? Is there, is there, a, is there a legal remedy there? Um, or? It's more likely to be a civil legal remedy, um, yes. I would suggest, in terms of the tendering of contracts and in terms of well, the Well, duty of care, process. yes, is civil, yes, but I meant yes. it might verge on um, the, the, it, it, I mean, being it depend, part. It would depend entirely on the circumstances yes. and the state of knowledge, etc., etc., but it's something that you know we wouldn't be adverse to looking at, certainly, if we have good evidence to suggest that that's being done. I think what I'm getting at is there other other parties to contacts that regularly mm -hmm. are quite easily giving them out to the wrong sort of companies, you know, who, so they're, they're in it together. Yes, I'll take Mr Wilson first because he was ready, Mr McDonald. Uh, yes. I think Alan will come in. I mean, within the environmental legislation, um, there is provision within uh, a, a number of uh, acts for duty of care. Um, the, the, the question is whether duty of care is fully understood in terms of the responsibilities on the operators. Um, that has been in effect, uh, in effect for a number of years uh, in, in various guises, but more needs to be done in terms of its enforcement and bringing that back to the attention of the industry. Uh, we did um, hold and continue to hold discussions with uh, industry and professional bodies, and we have outlined um, uh, at the launch of, uh, of CESA's uh, Pathway to Zero Waste as recently as uh, 2012, that duty of care lies at the heart of that and they have a, and they have a, a joint and, uh, responsibility to undertake duty of care. Uh, and that's been reinforced in, in recent legislation also. Mr MacDonald then, um, Ms Evans. Thank you. Um, Stephen Freeland mentioned earlier that uh, the duty of care legislation around waste has been around for, for um, 20 years plus. Um, uh, the key thing to, to note about it, though, is it was designed pretty much as a, a self-policing mechanism. Um, there are literally millions of transactions in a year around uh, the, the movement of, of waste materials, and it would be impossible um, to actively uh, and proactively police all these transactions. So the system, uh, as designed 20 years ago, um, the intention was that it be self-policing, and that's part of the problem. Thank you. The, the duty of care system, and, and um, when we discussed that in, in, a, 
an industry forum in, in, in CISA or, or, or wherever is, is to the operators and it's to the people who've, who understand what duty of care is and what duty of care needs to do and, and, and everything. But it comes down to um, there's, there's a, a bunch of new businesses that, that are required to, to um, look for contracts and, and, and do all this. And, and primarily as a householder, then, would you know that you need a transfer note and you have to be a, a, a regulated carrier to, to take that waste away? You put your bin out and the local authority takes that. You know, and, I question on the grounds that I may have breached the duty of care. <laughs> but uh, as a householder, you, that's not something you no. would think about automatically. We've now got more and more... Small businesses, especially, who then are not aware that the, the rules are different for business waste, um, and, and that's on that's on all scale. Um, so I think duty of care works for the people who know what it is and, and, and that it's, it's it's fine. But there's a whole education layer missing at the moment of of, of those responsibilities. Mr. Freeland, yeah, I'm just following on from that. Uh, there are moves to move from a, a paper-based to an electronic-based approach to the duty of care, which is very much welcomed and should uh, provide a greater oversight uh, into the movement and transaction of, of waste uh, and hopefully then be able to pinpoint exactly where the problems are lying. What do you mean, electronic? Well, at, at the moment... It's not a magic word. You know, what does it actually... Uh, at, at, at the moment, uh, when a, a high street waste producer contracts with their um, waste collector is, is a paper-based uh, note which says I've picked up from X location, I've taken X waste and I'm taking it to destination Y. Mm -hmm. uh, and that paper then gets stored in a box. And, also and it's more waste. <laughs> and it then gets, it gets stored by various different parties in the chain. And it then means that if SEPA then do come and are required to try and do an audit of where that waste has gone and who's been handling it, that should be available. And unfortunately, a less scrupulous operator is less inclined to keep hold of this. Uh, so if we're all moving to an electronic-based system, it's making, uh, rather than paper-based, it's all um, transfers of spreadsheets and uh, handheld electronic gadgets. And where does it go? Does it just stay with the person well, who's then, put it on the database? Well, then it can be uploaded to SEPA's systems okay. automatically, uh, which would hopefully provide a bit more oversight into this process. Thank you. I, I need these things explained to me. This happens. Just, just to add to that, as, as the electronic system and the paper system, then um, there's, there's been a gap historically between... Um, waste collection information and the, the site information. Um, so it's, it's, it's been quite difficult, I would say, for, for SEPA to match um, where somebody says things are going to on the collection systems, on a paper system, to actually okay. are those sites available. So pulling the electronic systems together um, will make that much more transparent. Mr Wilson. Yeah. Um, the electronic duty of care um, has been introduced. It's a voluntary uh, system at the minute. Uh, there's perhaps something that can be looked at in the future in terms of making it uh, compulsory at some point, but we're a long distance away from that at the moment. Uh, what it does allow is uh, for, uh, we hope it will allow for more systematic analysis of, of these uh, waste flows. Um, the system as is just now with this paper-based system is open to abuse. Uh, if you're an unscrupulous operator, you can falsify, you can copy, you can um, you can do whatever you want with the paperwork. Um, and it's clearly an avenue that uh, criminals will exploit. Uh, we, going back to the specialist question that, that kicked this particular area off there, there needs to be no more work done on financial investigation. There needs to be more work done on uh, analysis of these waste flows to understand where the trends are in terms of where we're seeing movements that don't make sense. Uh, and where there's hot spots where we see that waste that shouldn't be going to a particular site is going. Um, that analytical work uh, has been done by staff within the agency just now. It is difficult using this paper-based model because there's so many copies and so much paper uh, that's, in the, that's in the system at the minute. Can you expand on the, how you say it's voluntary? Can you expand on... It's percentages using it or some, give some idea of the... Well, electronic duty of care is just being introduced. Um, it's um, a number of operators already have electronic systems where they, for their own particular business model, they have duty of care systems in an electronic form where they uh, follow the flow of their materials because it's in their own commercial interest to do so. And so there's um, a, a natural reluctance to change from one system that they've spent time and money invested on that they're content with to move towards a centralised system uh, that is effectively in the hands of the regulators. 
Um, yes, it's voluntary, Sandra. Right. That's why I'm and pursuing councils it. Councils aren't involved in that either to put this all together, because that's to me that is one of the biggest questions. Yeah. If you have a small business, you've jumped the queue, but I'll let you. Well, I'm very sorry. I've you've come in. There's a big queue pretty, here on my pig list. I think I've been pretty patient. John Penland will be very cross. He sorry, was next after no, Let John in then. Go it is me. voluntary, so we'll come back to that because yeah, you've raised a very John important point. Quite often in these discussions, we get down to nitty gritty, and, and we're getting to nitty gritty on nitty gritty. Graham, I'll let you in because you're representing the Rural Development Environment Committee. That's the only reason I'm letting you ahead of the queue. Uh, thank you for John, indulging me, convener. Um, I was struck in the written evidence of, uh, with an assertion that said that some sites are operating without any licences at all. Now, that may be small scale. I'm sure you can expand upon that. But it strikes me that in talking about duty of care, should there not be a basic requirement, if it's practical, that whoever is uh, small companies, whatever, because I presume local authorities would check whether sites were licensed, that the person who's issuing the contract or tying into the contract is actually required to check that whoever is taking their waste away has the appropriate licences. I wonder if that's something that could be developed. Now, who's going to deal with that? Mr MacDonald. Happy to take that. Um, th that is the requirement at the moment. Um, so the, the, duty of the duty of care does require that, that, that every person in the chain passes it on to someone who's entitled to take it. Um, and you know, right to disposal. Um, but it ha that hasn't stopped um, the, the uh, increase in the growth in illegal sites, completely illegal sites with no licence. Okay. okay. Now, I'm going to take three questions, as I did before. John, your question, John Pentland, Christian and Sandra. Um, and so, John, can I have yours and then... Well, my question is, is perhaps just following up again on the duty of care. And, and, you know, I think Linda said that, you know, when this kind of group meet, you know, that's probably one of the topical subjects that, 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 that is brought to the table. But have you ever considered that, you know, perhaps my understanding is that most of the, you know, the crime is associated with the uh, recyclers who have exemption and, uh, you know, they don't require a licence. And, you know, in a good, I suppose, a good... Uh, uh, the way backing it up was there, a, there was an operator in my constituency uh, a couple of months ago, and you're talking, whether it cost the public purse, it cost the public purse nearly £400,000 to clear up. And it also brings in uh, the, the, the case of awareness. You know, the general public who live in and around that area uh, didn't think there was anything wrong because, you know, they, they were of the opinion that because they were able to, to, to stock the tyres, they were able to, but obviously that, that, that was thing. So I've, I'm, I'm, I've ever wondered if, if the table could maybe comment that, that perhaps we should be in a position where we should start uh, suspending exemptions for recyclers. And... The second, my second point I'd like to be, and again it's because of, of what happened to my constituency, uh, and this is the kind of question my constituency were asking me, is there not a, a, a proper audit for tyre disposal? That's, that, that's two, thank you. It's at least just two, not four, like Margaret, but there we are. <laughs> um, I've got Christian and Sandra. I'm going to put Roderick and Alison in the next batch, so we are not forgotten. Uh, Christian, what's your question? Yes, I, I wonder if you're not uh, going away from the main point, which is about uh, serious uh, organised organized crime. You know, what, what we're talking about the last five minutes is more about regulating normal legitimate businesses as opposed to uh, serious organised crime who will make sure to have a facade which are uh, very uh, well uh, well seen and, and will make sure to, to, to follow up all the new regulations you, you can put up to. I was going back to the public awareness and particularly what Linda once said about uh, uh, people in, in, in this sector. You know, how we a soft touch as Scotland, as we see ourselves maybe free from that serious organized crimes which could see prevalent in other countries like Italy, for example. I know that in the sector I used to work in, the camera was very much involved in the Northeast, and it was seen as incredible. You know, people rejected it and thinking, and even companies working in that particular sector where they did in fair trade thought that it was not possible, that not in this country, not in the UK, not in Scotland, it, would, it wouldn't happen. So how can we address this? Is this part of the biggest problem that we feel that organised crime, serious organised crime, is not in, in, in this country? And if we can talk about it, do we need a private session maybe as a committee to, uh, to talk about this particular subject? Uh, 
I think that's something the committee would discuss at the end as we, we have our wash up on this um, at the next um, item. Um, Sandra. Thank, thank you very much. I'll be very kind of letting you in when you jump the queue, but I'll yeah, let I you I apologise for that, but uh, I think for the time we'd been on, we did wander off in, in slightly different directions, I think. I mean, it's been we've got ten, ten organised ten organised crime groups already, so it's obviously expanding, and it's not just in Scotland because it's cross border, and it's obviously you know even in the rest of Europe bringing you know uh, you know waste in, into our country and obviously exporting it as well. But what came out of uh, what we've had so far for me, anyway, is we're looking at two issues here. We're looking at illegal sites. Uh, how do you how do you manage to close those down? And we're looking at the so-called legal sites, which is, in my mind, where the organised crime is, because it's part of money laundering. So what, what, what is the problem with the legal sites, then? Are they not licensed properly? Is it not followed through? Is the audit, which has just been said, I find it quite unbelievable. Most of us have had constituents with a small business who have to pay quite a big bit up front uh, to take hazardous waste, like asbestos, for instance. Uh, and if somebody else comes along and said, well, I'll take it off your hands at a cheap price, yeah, they're going to do it. But like other areas, there is an audit trail if you go forward. So where does the problem lie? Is the problem lying in the illegal sites that are opening up for dumping? Or is the problem lying in legal sites where known criminal gangs are being a front there, is it, uh, I think it was Mr Macdonald that mentioned at the beginning, a low barrier for entry. You know, how do we tighten that up in the legal sites then? How do we stop organised crime from laundering money? Uh, you know, we've mentioned it all before, but it has to do with licensing, auditing and uh, basically right. looking into it. I want, to, I want to try and please remind me if I've Sorry. got your question wrong, because my handwriting is that of a medical practitioner. Um, you were asking, I think, John, about suspending exemptions for recyclers as one of your things when you known it, and an audit, and that to some extent picks up on Sandra's an audit trail. Yours was tire disposal, but yours is an audit trail for illegal and legal sites and what's going on. Why is? I think we're looking at two different things. From my mind here, we're talking about illegal sites where it's being dumped and nobody's fallen up in it, but we're actually talking about legal sites, which in my opinion, and I'm not saying evidence I've got, but certainly in my area, I have people come to me and say there are legal sites that have been run by criminals. So that's a front. So why, how do we stop that? The site itself, the rather site than... Itself, yes, OK, I hear your site, question. But right? it's run by criminals. And um, also, um, you said, Christian, that you... The position from your experience in the North East is that people just don't believe, we don't have a, like a McMafia here, uh, that they just don't believe it's happening at that level, that serious organised crime perhaps is so clever in Scotland that they just don't think it's at that level. And perhaps how do we make plain, well, this meeting is one of those reasons for it. Uh, and the other thing, Sandra, which you raised was cross-border assets are being exported by serious, out of Scotland and into Scotland. Uh, now, can I just... I leave these all there so that you can start answering the whole lot together or pick and mix. So who's going first? Mr Wilson, you're in first. Yeah, um, taking waste tyres, um, waste tyre um, recycling uh, uh, is a significant problem, not just in Scotland, but across the UK and beyond. Um, there are companies that operate business models that, frankly, uh, do not stand scrutiny. Um, they, a number of which are able to run under exemptions, which means they don't have a full waste management licence uh, requirement because the storage limits are under a certain uh, uh, quota, etc. Um, the site that was referred to, I, I can't go into the detail of that too much, obviously. Because because that's that's the nice crime might just be listening to this session. Yeah, so, We're aware um, of that. <laughs> but in terms of that, um, we are working closely with the government in looking at particularly the exemptions regime around waste tyres. Um, to change that work is obviously uh, it's not something that can be done overnight. Uh, but we're working with Environment Quality Division at, uh, within the Scottish Government uh, looking at that particular issue because it has uh, uh, been not just a problem in North Lanarkshire but beyond that. And it's, a, oh, yes. it's an area that we're closely um, uh, concerned with. And we are monitoring a number of sites across the country that uh, are on a priority list for us to undertake regular and repeated inspections and compliance and, if necessary, enforcement activity. Um, and that work will continue. It's not a short-term fix because... The legitimate markets for waste tyres in the country are limited, um, and so there is a, an overflow of this waste product. Um, and so it does, again, open itself up. It's, it touches on um, 
uh, Mr Allard's comment about the export materials as well. Uh, waste tyres uh, can be exported along with other waste streams, um, and Scotland does export significant quantities of waste overseas, particularly to West Africa, but also to the Far East, uh, China in particular, and India. Uh, and it's an area that we are concerned with also because not only do we have a duty here in the country, no, of course. we also have a duty beyond that in terms of trans-frontier shipment, illegal waste shipments. And it's an area that the agency is strongly involved in, not just here in the country, but involved with European and other partners uh, working with law enforcement agencies such as Interpol and Europol and with other professional groups uh, within Europe uh, also. In a way, you might also morally argue you have a greater duty to underprivileged countries that perhaps don't have the regulation that, that you know, is used as a, a waste dump for yes, Western uh, societies. Yes. Yeah. Well, and also a legislative responsibility. Oh, absolutely, but I'm talking just yeah. on top Moral, of that. Yeah. Um, you didn't address the issue of suspended exemptions for recyclers. John, do you want to reiterate that? What was the... Uh, not quite. In terms of that, I mean, that re returns again to uh, uh, issues in relation to exemptions. We can suspend exemptions, we can sp suspend licenses, or, or, or indeed take licenses uh, from individ in individual operators. Um, again, it's down to what is the, our, our course of action that best fits the, the situation that we found on any particular given site. Uh, so there's a range of options in terms of enforcement through to compliance, through to warning letters, and, uh, and there's a suite of options that are open to the agency to, to, to apply, and we do so. Um. Mr MacDonald. key point, though, is that simply removing a, a licence or suspending a, 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 an exemption registration doesn't actually solve the problem. The tyres have to go somewhere, and there's a, the absence of a market for, for the use of these materials or, or the reuse of these materials that's part of the problem. So simply tackling it from the point of view of the site where the, where the materials are dumped um, uh, is not the answer. It's, it's, you know, it doesn't bring the whole answer. Um, so a collaborative effort is, is required in terms of developing markets, talking to um, the, the, the waste management industry uh, to help in that respect. And, um, you know, there are more than... Uh, you know, a significant number of players who, who have got a role to play in this. I've got nobody else indicating that. What about Soft Touch Scotland, I think, which was, if I put it in that colloquial way, is that the case? Uh, uh, well, I, I wouldn't suggest that that's... that's... I don't mean you're defaulting. No, I don't no. mean the police. I'm talking about public, per public perceptions that, you know, they don't believe that it's such an issue. Um, I suppose to some extent that, that, is, that is true. I mean, do the public know the extent that, you know, we've got 220 organised crime groups, that there's 3,500 members, uh, all that kind of stuff. I've said that on many occasions in the media. Um, but do the public know and understand what the consequence of that is? Perhaps not. And, but that's one, of, I'm guessing that's one of the reasons for this session, is that the public become more aware of uh, just exactly what organised crime is involved in. It is part of the reason. Can I ask um, what Police Scotland, who has a lot of information campaigns have been very useful. You know, um, we've been on this publicity thing before, but how much have you actually done? I may, I may be, we've already dealt with this on that particular aspect. On environmental crime or, or on yeah, just, uh, the broader just, serious just, organised crime? Just take it on environmental crime, which people tend to... It's invisible. Yeah, I mean, it's we, not we, like vandalism. It is a vandalism, but they we, don't see it. You know. We probably haven't done... We haven't done very much in terms of environmental crime itself. It takes me back to exactly what I said before, because I try, we try to keep, keep it across all commodities so that we're actually talking to to the public and the media about uh, about all commodities that, that uh, organised crime is involved in, because they're unlikely just to be involved in environmental crime. They will have firearms, they will have drugs, uh, they will have you know, everything else that you can think of. So they are about making money. Uh, and uh, So it's about their threat, risk and harm to our communities. Uh, and it's about territory. Um, and they'll use violence uh, as their competitive advantage in terms of making sure that they get... So they undermine uh, or they undercut uh, contracts in terms of finance, but they also use violence and other uh, and other facets to make sure that they get these uh, these contracts. So, I think it's uh, the, the general public understanding what organised crime is involved in across the spectrum, uh, rather than just environmental crime. So, my focus is, uh, is is across that spectrum to make sure that there is that real understanding uh, of of what uh, what serious organised crime is involved with. Mr. Wilson, followed by Mr. McDonald, followed by Mr. Freeland. 
Yes. Um, in terms of the, the question is about the Scotland of Soft Touch, I would, I would say it's not. Um, is it more to be done? Definitely. Um, how do we compare with other countries? Um, better than a number. I mean, uh, Mr. Allen, I've touched on Italy. They're, they have a well entrenched problem with uh, mafia clans, um, particularly within the waste sector, within the, 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 the southern half of the country. Um, they are anxious to do more uh, in relation to that. They, they have seen the export of that uh, uh, criminal model beyond the, the, the Italian borders uh, into Eastern Europe in particular. Uh, we as an agency are, are engaging with a touch on Interpol and Europol. We're, we're partners within the Pollution Working Group and we're anxious to take part in initiatives that will look to learn best practice and maybe better experience of other countries uh, and, and share that. Um, so we are working on a project with uh, funding we see from the EU Life uh, Plus bid, which looks specifically at that area, uh, about seeing what are the vulnerabilities in the market that make it so attractive to criminals to, that want to operate in this, why not other industry sectors, and more particularly in the year ahead, we'll look at what particular waste streams is it that are the, 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 the target focus. Uh -huh. um, Mr Pentland touched on waste tyres, I would say that was one, clearly. But there's a number of other challenging waste streams that are difficult to dispose of, that have little if negligible value in terms of uh, resource uh, and recyclability. Uh, the value has been taken out of them. So therefore they attract, in terms of their commingled nature, a higher tax rate. Examples, please. Uh, waste fines, which is the, the, the effect of the, the detritus from the, 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 the material recycling facilities that have been commingled to such an extent that they can only go to a landfill that attracts a higher rate, a standard rate of tax. Okay. That rate of tax is £80 per tonne. If it was a net material on its own, it's £2.50. That £2.50, not £80, is the margin in which criminals operate. So tax avoidance is an extremely attractive and a highly profitable area in which you can exploit. Thank you. Mr MacDonald. Um, Willie has pretty much addressed that. I was going to say something about um, is Scotland a soft touch, so Willie's pretty much addressed that. Um, just with regard to in, um, uh, international comparisons, again, I agree entirely with Willie that um, uh, we are not, um, uh, we don't have the same scale of problem as exists in uh, other countries, for example, Italy, and I don't want us ever to get anywhere near that. Um, so uh, I think we, we need to be vigilant. In fact, I would suggest that Scotland punches above its weight in, in Europe um, and the environmental crime task force model that we've developed here is the envy um, of many countries and it's been suggested for, uh, for rolling out um, uh, uh, in, in different parts of the world. Um, uh, the question of um, raising public awareness has come up a number of times and I, I just wanted to take an opportunity of a wee free advert um, around a, a, an event that the Environmental Crime Task Force is organising um, in November late, uh, later this year. Um, it will be in Edinburgh. Uh, we'll have um, keynote speakers, including um, the Cabinet Secretary for Rural Affairs and the Environment. Uh, we'll have Frank Mulholland, the Lord Advocate, speaking at that, and various representatives from other bodies on the uh, Environmental Crime Task Force. And I would very much welcome attendance by members of this committee and other parliamentarians. Um, mm -hmm. The message is we're trying mm -hmm. to raise awareness. You see, of the that's subject. a poor trailer because you didn't tell us where, when, and the time, the date. So if you want to advertise, you need to put those in. I'll give you the exact dates. They'll be made available to the committee. <laughs> uh, I'd dearly love to see some of the some of the members of this committee, um, you know, uh, in in the body of the Kirk. Um, Depends, to to that. obviously, to parliamentary commitments. Uh, absolutely, I think I they're very interested. Um, Ms. Sweetman, yes. I think that Not Ms. Evans, I speak upon. No, Mr. Freeman was first. Freeland was oh, first. Sorry. Yes, sorry. I'm jumping. My yellow is jumping before my eyes now. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, just looking down my, my wee notes, um, I think just going back to one of uh, the points that uh, Sandra had raised. Uh, but before I do, just for the record, um, there is a legitimate uh, trade and export of materials for recycling. We accept that. Yeah. We're not, you're not on trial. <laughs> uh, and if it wasn't for exports, um, our recycling rate wouldn't be anywhere near where it is at the moment. Um, but my point was, I think uh, Sandra's trying to see whether there was a distinction uh, between a, a, a fully illegal site and one which was operating uh, with a licence. When I see five types of, of sites, you've either got a fully illegal landfill site, uh, you've got an illegal recycling operation, uh, you've got the licensed sites 
which is uh, deliberately abusing its conditions for, for, for uh, financial gain. Uh, you've also got a licensed site acting as a front for legal activity. And also the fifth one, as it's just really stopped upon, is this deliberate misclassification of materials to benefit from different uh, lower tax rates. So I'm not sure whether there is actually a distinction between these. I think envi um, environmental criminals are operating across all these sites uh, and they've got a foothold in all and will probably use a whole range uh, of these sites. So I think uh, our effort needs to be focused on the bigger picture rather than just on an illegal site or one that's operating for okay. licence that's not doing Thank its Thank you, that's very helpful. Yes, now, Ms. Thank you. I think, I think what would help raise awareness and, and raise the profile of all of this is for some cases to, to make it through the system and actually be available as, as local cases and, and publicly um, told in terms of the, the financial impact to the taxpayer and to, and to the general public and, and how these all come out. Now, I know there are, there are a number in the system that, that we can't talk about, but, but really for, for events such as, as Callum's in November, to be able to stand up and say, this is the evidence. And that's the frustration of the industry, is that, that we, ha we, we know illegal activity is, is, is being undertaken. Um, but it's anecdotal. We can't put facts and figures and numbers to that. Um, we know it's happening, and, and, and we, can, we can pass some of that on, or, or all of it on, we hope. Um, but then we hear nothing back. The, the time taken to take these cases through means that um, you, don't, you don't know if anything's happened. If, and, and in the meantime, then, uh, the compliant operators are, are, are um, being regulated uh, in their own capacity and, and maybe falling foul of their conditions, um, not deliberately. Uh, so, that, so they are getting the hard line from the regulators, but not seeing what's happening with the bigger picture in these cases coming through. Contact later now. At last, Roderick, your time has come in Alison. So can I have your yeah, questions, no, please? Um, my points have largely been discussed, but I just wanted to raise the question of whether the regulatory regime was adequate and or, or whether it was fundamentally more of a problem uh, following on from what Mr. Freeland and indeed what uh, Lynn Dovins has said, um, that organised crimes evade the regulatory regime by presenting a facade of compliance, employing managers and consultants to mask activities. Well, general comments we had on, on those points. And Alison? It's, it's quite similar to, to Roddy's point. Um, we heard from the, it would be useful to hear from the witnesses, uh, the industry witnesses, whether there are weaknesses in the current system of licensing and monitoring that makes it particularly attractive um, to illegal operators. Mm -hmm. All right. Who wants to? Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Rumpel. Thank you. Could I come in um, from Ms. Evans point? Um, Recognise that successful um, outcomes is actually a really good way of raising public awareness. And I think it's just important to recognise that organised crime is so fluid um, with organised criminals seeking new opportunities. And obviously, you know, this is a relatively new opportunity for organised criminals um, in terms of the increase that the, the ACC Nicholson identified. Mm. Um, as, as people are aware, we are working closely with SEPA and the Police Service of Scotland on a very large and complex environmental crime, money laundering, potential tax evasion, inquiry, um, which we, we can't talk about. No. But we do recognise that effective prosecution um, is an important element in the strategy to reduce the harm of organised crime. Um, what, what we haven't actually talked about is, is the asset recovery, because that's also very, very effective, um, hitting the criminals where it, where it hurts in, in their pocket. Um, as ACC Nicholson identified, um, serious and organised crime is about making money. So, you know, what we can do is, is try to take that money away from them. Um, and the legislation in terms of the Proceeds of Crime Act is there. Um, and I know that SEPA have now got their own financial investigators to identify the benefits, to identify the assets and where that um, occurs. And there's a link to the organised crime groups. Then we can restrain them and then we can ultimately, in the event of a conviction, um, seek for confiscation. And we will do that as best we possibly can where, where we have every opportunity in terms of the evidence to do so. Mr. Wilson. Yeah, just touching on, on the legislation, um, we uh, now have the Regulatory Reform Act the, uh, that uh, is, is, came about as a recognition that the, the various forms of legislation that were in place needed to be revisited substantially in terms of giving us more enhanced powers, being leaner in terms of how we operate that legislation and making it easier and not overly bureaucratic for, for industry itself. So we're now looking towards having a simpler, simplified and integrated framework and working under one regime rather than a series of regimes 
that were not, was not helpful to industry, was not helpful to our own re regulatory staff either in terms of how they apply these compliance models. So that legislation has been approved. We, we're, we're working through that. But in addition to that, that is also giving us law enforcement uh, powers as well. Um, and again, just touching on sentencing, within that Regulatory Reform Act work, we're also looking at um, improved compensation, uh, and, uh, improved uh, uh, a requirement on us to describe financial benefit, and so that that's taken into close account when it comes to sentencing and when it comes to, uh, to prosecutions as, itself. And lastly, on that touch, we've now had for the first time a new offence of significant environmental harm. And again, that will itself bring a, an aggravation, as it were, to the legislation that didn't previously exist. And again, should allow us, in terms of placing information before the, uh, the, ju the judicial system, uh, the evidence to support consideration for other sentences. Thank you. I've got Mr. McDonald, then Mr. Freeland. Mr. McDonald. Um, yeah, just so, just adding to what Willie has just said, um, th these new enforcement powers that are coming to us as a result of the Regulatory Reform Act are very welcome. Um, they will be available to us from, from um, April of next year, and also there will be some new sentencing powers available for the courts as a, as a result of that legislation. But um, an improved environmental regulatory regime on its own um, isn't going to be enough to successfully tackle um, uh, organised criminals and, 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 um, and, and environmental crime. Um, uh, this is going to take um, a, a, a more uh, in the way of collaboration between um, all the different parties involved and a bit of creativity, I think, um, moving forward. Um, and I think uh, the, the, the strategy around the four Ds um, has to come into play in this, in this respect as well. So I, I, I'd welcome that. Mr Freeland. Yeah, just going back to uh, Alison McInnes' points about where the weaknesses might be in the system. Uh, I see three weaknesses. Uh, the first one being, as we said at the very beginning, um, Cal McDonald said the barriers to entry are low. You need a truck and a skip and off you go. And uh, that, that's you. Uh, so that, that's a problem which I, I think needs to be addressed by uh, the, the fit and proper person test at the beginning to make sure that's properly looked at. The other weakness is uh, with the exemptions. Uh, the exemptions are, are used by the legitimate industry as well. They're, they're purely for dealing with a, a small amount of low-risk materials. Uh, but it does uh, have a light-touch approach to that regulation of those activities, and that's what's been exploited. So it, it needs greater oversight of that. Uh, and also, I think, given the, the, the plans that are foot to change the regulatory regime, uh, there's going to be new tiers of, of regulatory oversight. I think that should help to, to address that problem. Um, so that's well, I, I'm going to stop there. Actually, you've summed up, you see, for your point. I said to the last round table, if there's one issue that you want us to take forward, one thing that might be remedied and requires, and, and I'm not going to come round necessarily and volunteer yourself as the first person, one issue you want us to consider when we consider this um, in the next session. I think I'll just leave yours because you've given three. You can have come back just have one then, but what I'll do is say, so who wants to come forward with one thing that they think from their particular perspective the committee should be taking forward? Mr. McDonald, it's only one, remember, yep. and we're waiting I, for the date, date and the time and the place, but that's I'm, not the issue. I one. promise you I'll stick to one. Um, I would like us to get to the point where um, we can use intelligence to influence um, procurement decisions. Right. Who, who wants to come next with one issue they want us to bring forward? You don't have to have one if you don't want one, but if there's something that we should be looking at. Yes, Ms. Evans. I would say speed up the prosecution service, however we can work together to do that. Right. Uh, close on the loophole on the, the duty of care. Right. Anybody else? Mr Wilson. Mr. Yes, I'll take Mr Wilson. Sorry, yes. Um, and I'll take cases. Everything that's been said, financial, in financial investigation and financial intelligence sharing between all the partners. Thank you. ACC Nicholson. Yeah, I think that's just supporting that. That's just opening the gateway so that we can better share intelligence in terms of what, what we know and 
is a good example, uh, given there where there's a knowledge that uh, at a local level that criminality is involved in that, but, but how do you use that kind of information and intelligence to, to good effect to make sure that criminality is not involved? So that's the kind of thing that we, we really need to focus on. I think. Yes, Mr Mandel. Support, uh, uh, You're allowed a separate one. No, we no, we know you agree. To, to, to create the biggest step change, I think the information uh, sharing and the barriers that are attached to that at the moment, I think that would give us the biggest single okay. step change and in turn, in due course, help uh, advance the pace of dealing with the enforcement side through, through the courts, etc. Yes. I don't, don't disagree with any of that, but I think from my, my, my plea is just to continue with the, the massive amount of collaborative working that's, that's, that's ongoing and make sure that, that we all continue that information sharing and talking to each other. So I think everybody's had a, a say. Now, thank you very much. Oh, you know, did I miss you out, Mr Freeland? Well, I think I, I summed up with duty of care. <laughs> no, we've looked after Mr Freeland. <laughs> it does, we have. I didn't miss him. Thank you very much. It was extremely useful. And thank you for your time, uh, which is very valuable. I'll suspend for uh, two or three minutes to let the room clear, and then we'll go into private session.